Okay, so I accidentally left my uh, camera. I accidentally left my camera on all night. So I don't even know what the battery percentage is. If it turns off, we're just going to roll with it. So that's what, that's what will happen. First, let's get this out of the way. I want to talk about the PlayStation Portal, right? I got a case for it. That's a number one accessory that I recommend for the PlayStation Portal. It is a super awkwardly shaped device. This case is useful whether you have it at home or otherwise. So get yourself a case. This one happens to be like a... 10 15 dollar case um i got it from a brand that i don't even think is international uh so i'm not gonna leave you a link and besides they don't pay me to leave you a link so whatever uh but yeah get yourself a case and i'll show you a little bit about the contents uh, of this case so i really do like it uh so basically these are the two halves as you can see we've got the portal itself there uh i also have a power bank so uh the portal will give you about four hours of battery life give or take uh so having a power bank uh it's a pretty slim one so this one that i've had for years pretty slim power bank and the reason that it is so slim is that if it happens to fall on the joysticks this particular power bank will still allow me to close the case so it was just one of those considerations and also if you put it in the middle there you can see there's a little bit of sag in this particular case so i just don't want a heavy power bank actually striking the screen so there is that uh i've also got wired headphones so these are kind of like emergency headphones so that if I need to, you know, play the game and I'm not at home and I don't have access to my other headphones, I can still just do it right off the bat. These headphones are just going to stay in the case forever. Uh, then over here, this is a wire to connect my overhead headphones. So in case I'm already wearing the headphones that I prefer anyway, this will allow me to connect to the portal because it doesn't support Bluetooth. We've already talked about that. Power cable to recharge the actual um, PlayStation portal. And if you have an Android phone or a newer iPhone, it is USB-C on one end at least. So you can also use it to charge your phone. So I guess that's kind of convenient. Okay, now we have the portal itself. So let me get out of get, get it out of the case so that uh, we can talk a little bit more about it. So <clears throat> here's the device. Um, right, let me just go into kind of a standard mode. At the moment, I'm playing Dave the Diver. You know, you guys can kind of boom, 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 this way. There we go. You can kind of see that, Dave the Diver. Uh, it's really enjoying it. Now, one more accessory that is not uh, optional is the screen protector. This is a big screen. It is an eight inch screen and it is, I mean, listen, your, your hands are right there. It's something that you will touch because you will at least use the touchpad. So you're touching it all the time. You're gonna get your oils on it. Um, even if you have it in a case like this one, there's a good chance that things within that case, when you're moving around, they might strike it, they might move it, they might scratch it. Just make sure, guys, that you absolutely get a screen protector. I don't think it's optional. In fact, I think that the device should have come with one pre-applied, at least the basic plastic ones pre-applied, just to protect against scratches. But I've got one of those glass tempered ones, you know, it was only like 15 bucks again on Amazon for like three of them. So you have a few ch a few chances to try if you, you know, get air bubbles or whatever. But I was really fortunate that on the first application, um, everything was perfect. So, and it goes all the way to the edges. So once the screen protector is applied, unless you know that it's there, you probably won't notice it. And, you know, it doesn't change the texture fundamentally from the glass that is already, you know, on the actual device itself. But yes, I do not see this as a device where you can choose whether or not you have a screen protector or not like it's just you should get one um okay let's talk a little bit about network connectivity and all of that now like most people i use my device 99 percent at home in fact i barely use it when i'm outside mostly because i don't really have um the, the need to so i work from home most of the time and when i'm not working at home then in those places i don't really have a break so to speak where i will be using the portal in between things so that is what it is that's my situation um it does work well when it is not at home but it works better if you are on wi-fi on the other side because you can play the playstation portal away from home what will need to happen is that you will need to enable the settings so that your playstation 5 can be turned on remotely from rest mode um, and you will also then need to connect both ends using some kind of Wi-Fi service. Now, you could use your mobile hotspot, but in Australia, the network that I'm in, Optus, my goodness, they are disappointing with their speeds. To be fair, I'm on a 4G device. 
I don't know if on a 5G device, the network would suddenly get better. And I am thinking about switching networks because even at my house, I don't really get good mobile network. I get good Wi-Fi, of course, um, but mobile network or even just mobile reception, it's not something that is great. It's just, um, yeah, the, the, the network connectivity is, is incredibly sparse from that perspective. So not really a fan of that. As a result of this, uh, I've been able to play the portal at the beach. There was one um, one Twitter post that I did where I played at the beach. By the time I was with a friend and I used their mobile network uh, because they just were getting way better speeds. So that was my experience there. And listen, it can be super frustrating when you have a um, mobile hotspot, even if you're staying in the same place. Like I think that mobile networks, um, listen, I suspect that when you're using a lot of data really quickly, I suspect the throttle the reception because my experience at the beach was that for like the first 10, 15 minutes, no hiccups, no problems. But then after that, the, um, the network will start to degrade until I like relaunch the hotspot again. And then it was plenty fast. So I think that's like super anti-consumer things from like the ISPs and the network providers there. But, if you guys are in a different place, in a different state, or just using a different mobile carrier, you could be having a completely different experience. So your mileage will vary when it comes to um, actual network speeds. Now, they recommend five megabits per second at the minimum in order to use the portal pretty much anywhere. But obviously the more you have, the better. And at home, um, I'm pretty sure that it rides on just the mobile network, uh, sorry, just the Wi-Fi network. Um, so I don't think that your internet speeds matters, but when I'm away, um, my home Wi-Fi is like 250 megabits. And I find that if I'm on a, if I'm on the other side and I have at least 50 megabits per second, that will also just be as if I was at home with very few parcel loss. Um, what a device will do, and this is just a feature of remote play, it's not a feature of the portal, but they will um, give you like lower quality while it establishes a strong link with your PlayStation. So sometimes there might be periodic moments where for like five seconds, the resolution and the picture quality will drop, and then about five seconds later, it will get back again. So this doesn't happen often, and obviously the stronger your network is, um, the better experience you will have. Um, would it be better if this uh, device was completely had the option to play games natively at least some games yes it absolutely would if they came up with a playstation portal pro i'm not necessarily asking you to play god of war wack network natively on the device right that would be ridiculous but you know like take a look at a game like dave the diver this it could do it uh games like um tunic definitely could be done dredge i haven't played yet but most likely um, I've got, um, what is it, Grow Home over here, that's a PlayStation 4 game, again, super light title. Um, would they create the certification to be able to do that? You know, that's a whole process, but it would be really great if there was some native, you know, play where I know that, hey, listen, on the portal, if I'm connected to my PlayStation 5, I can play everything on the PlayStation 5, but if I choose to, I also have the option to download even just a select library, maybe just 500 games that are like certified to run natively on the Portal Pro. And then I know that I can take those games with me um, installed on the device and running natively from the device. So it would be great if there was like a Pro version that gave you that capability. Or at least even if those games were just like the PlayStation 4, the PlayStation 4 versions of games, you know, because there are 4,000 4, PlayStation 4 games. And I'm sure there's at least a good 500 of them that are like indie. Well, they don't have to be indie, but what I mean is that they are lighter kind of games, you know, things like um, Slay the Spire, you know. Yeah, it would be nice if there was a native way to play these games so that when you are not um, having the best time with Wi-Fi and networks outside of homes and everything, you still have something. So for example, on an airplane or on the train, you will still have something that you were playing. And if that was the game you were playing anyway, uh, you know, power be to you. But hey, that is not what it does. So we're not going to talk about what we wish it did. We're going to talk about what it does do. And what it does do is be phenomenal. Um, I really enjoy this device. So I got it back in like early March, late February, sometime like there. And I've got to tell you guys, this has been absolutely phenomenal. I was never a fan of the idea of the portal when I first heard about it. 
um but now i am a convert i believe i believe in it so i've been playing dave the diver there i see here i've got 47 hours registered on it and i can tell you that at least half if not more slightly more of those hours were done on the portal because dave the diver is one of those games where it's 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 a podcast game it's a game where you don't need fast reaction times it's relaxing it's chilling you know you can easily make a small mini goal for yourself and then leave the experience you know like so when i'm playing at night and i just want to be in my room especially because right now it's winter in australia and in terms of like saving electricity and bills right it's like i would rather heat up just my bedroom rather than having to heat up the entire open concept uh living room kitchen and you know for some reason the the developer that made this house didn't believe in doors so it's like it spills into like other parts of the house so it's like it's a it's a good volume of space to have to heat up in order to make it comfortable by comparison my room is much smaller um so i'm just like you know what i'm just going to be uh, a little bit more economical and i'm gonna go to my bedroom and i'm going to have a podcast on i'm going i'm gonna listen to a twitter space or you know a live stream or whatever it is and I'm just going to be chilling with the portal. And that has been a great experience. The only thing that I would say is that ergonomically, I don't love the experience of it, of looking down on it, if it's just on my lap. Like eventually my neck gets a little bit tired um, of just constantly looking down. So when I'm in my bedroom, I prop it up on pillows so that it can be more ergonomic. So just watch out for that. You know, you shouldn't be looking down at your phone for that long, you know? So whenever I hold my phone, I always try to hold it at like eye level as much as I can so that um, it doesn't create that bad you know kind of posture and everything like that so just make sure that you guys you know are taking care of your bodies as um as you play it so yeah it is phenomenal anything else that i want to say about it oh the audio uh i don't like the speakers on this i i, I never will uh they're very thin speakers um they're very screechy very hollow the sound just isn't good i don't think that headphones are, are optional with this device either I think when you when you pay for when you pay for this device, it's three hundred bucks or whatever in the US. Just buy yourself twenty dollar headphones, wired headphones that can go with it. Even if you're not typically used to wearing headphones, you know you just the sound is just not good. Um, they remind me of of TV speakers, except even more anemic. Um, so yeah, I would see that. Um, and the fact they don't have Bluetooth, listen, that is an issue, okay? Because it would be so much more convenient and universal. Um, if they have Bluetooth headphones, no problem. Whether they, there are technical reasons or whatever, it is a sad and unfortunate reality that they don't have Bluetooth. So wired headphones are your best bet. But the good thing is that wired headphones, I generally give you, for the same price point, a wired pair of headphones will typically give you better sound quality than a wireless pair of headphones. And then at least you don't have to worry about the battery life of those wired headphones as well as the portal. So you know what? You just make your peace with it and you plan around it. And like I said, I have a pair of headphones from yesteryear that would just stay in the in, in the case. And so they will never be separated. So that's also why the case is, you know, it's nice. It's convenient you have a place. Um, the only thing that I would say about the case is that um, I have an open mesh over here. It's open at the top, as you can see. So if, if you get a case, maybe get something where you can zip it up. Uh, that would be a little bit more convenient because sometimes some of these things kind of go flying out depending on whatever orientation the case has found itself in, in transit. Um, so yeah, that would be a nice thing um, if you did that. It is what it is. Okay, I'm um, just taking a look at my sheet here. I think, uh, yeah, I think I... I think I'm done with, with the specs and the stuff. Uh, the screen. Oh, I want to talk about the screen. The screen is gorgeous i mean it is just such a wonderful screen if you are in plain sunlight you will not really enjoy the experience but any bit of a shade even if it's just a shade from like trees or your own body will suddenly make the screen a lot more legible again so no it doesn't fight the sun you know it's not that bright um which will be a good thing because if it was that bright then you will only get like an hour of worth of battery life so yeah you can't use it in plain afternoon sun but a little bit of shade and you'll be back in business so the screen is phenomenal it is gorgeous it's a 1080p screen and everything looks super super sharp on it like it's it's just it's a really great quality i wouldn't want it to be 1440p or 4k i think those will be um the the, the downside that you will lose in battery life um will be far you know worse than what you're actually gaining um and yeah it's 60 frames per second 
I never really felt the need for 120 frames per second on it. Obviously, if we had it, nobody would complain. But again, I feel like if it was a 120 first frames per second screen, it will have to use that LTPO technology, I think it's called, so that it can boost the frame rate of the screen up and down depending on what is necessary. Uh, but since there are not that many games that run at 120 frames per second anyway, even on the big, you know, PlayStation 5, then you're not really missing out on much. So the screen is beautiful, it's vibrant, it's colorful. Uh, you never feel like you're missing out too much. It's not an OLED panel, but it is one of the best LCD panels I've seen in a long time. So, yeah, as soon as you stop scaring the can about the, the specs and the type of screen that it is, you realize it's a phenomenal screen. And then finally, the biggest reason to get this over any other solution that you can use to access remote play. By the way, just in case you didn't watch the last video, this hardware, the PlayStation Portal, has no native advantage over using remote play through any other device. So whether you use remote play on a PC, on a laptop, on another tablet, or on your phone, you will get the same consistent experience across all of those devices from a remote play feature perspective. So before you jump into a $200 purchase with a portal, please at least try remote play on your own networks or in your own places with the device that you already own because you already own devices that can access remote play with your PlayStation whether again that be your laptop your tablet your phone or your computer desktop kind of thing so yeah we don't need that and also i think they even added um chromecast i think some chromecast you know dongles can actually access remote play now so that'll make it so that you can just try remote play on your big tv so for example situation where you might have a single playstation in the house connected to its tv but then you may have a secondary tv in the master bedroom or in the i don't know in another like gaming room or another room in the house um that chromecast dongle could be the way that you actually prefer to use remote play in which case you may not find a need for a device such as this okay now big advantage of this device and a singular reason to get it over any other solution are the ergonomics this here the fact that this is a full controller in your hand it's so, oh my goodness, it is so far above every other device I've ever tried. I mean, the Switch is absolute garbage to hold. It is so awful to hold. I hate the Switch in portable mode. In fact, I refuse to play the Switch in portable mode. For me, the Switch is just a, put it into the dock, get the poor controller, and then play with it that way, because that's the only way. I can't stand the Joy-Cons. Um, this is the complete opposite. This is the dream. This is what every single handheld should be. Um, I know it looks silly. I know it's not the easiest shape to carry or to even just leave laid, laid down. Like, for example, you imagine like a Lenovo Legion Go. That is a very aesthetically pleasing, um, beautiful design shape. You know, it's like it's got a rectangular thing with just a few angles to be interesting. It's mostly flat. Uh, so when you leave it on like a console table or a table, it just it just looks like, yeah, this is a premium piece of technology. This looks maybe even just as premium, mm, maybe not, but it looks a little bit silly. It's just, you know, like this angle, like what you, this is what you look at from the side. It looks a little silly. Um, yeah, it looks like it has curves in weird places for a device like that. We are more used to, again, that kind of rectangular prism shape. But again, that all looks weird until you put it in your hands and then you're like, yes, this is what my hands want. They want to grab onto it. I've got big hands, guys. It's hard to do like a hand size comparison on the internet, but I do have big hands. You know, like I want those people that can grip a basketball with just the one hand. Um, so these ones you know like the end is a little bit shorter i think than like a full controller but still i never find myself like with slipping fingers or not able to touch or reach whatever it is that i want to you know reach for so it just feels great and i've had entire like four or five hours six hour play sessions just on this there was once where um oh well this will go more into how i actually use the device but let's go into it so how do i use this device Two primary places. The first place is in my bedroom because, again, for whatever reason, I'm tired. It's kind of late at night. Or sometimes I just don't want to get up in the morning. And it's good to reach for it. And I just kind of play, you know, kind of like slowly wake myself up with a game. Um, again, something like Dave the Diver is wonderful for that. The second place is actually I started using it in the last few days. 
I started using it in front of my TV because I realized, hey, I want to like keep up with a show. I want to watch an anime. And normally what I would do is that I will use my regular controller on the PlayStation and I will play through the TV and then I will have the whatever secondary media I'm watching on my phone. But then I realized, wait a second, I actually want to pay a little bit more attention with my eyes to what is on, on the TV. And so what I did is that I swapped it around. I used a portal in front of my main TV, which is funny because it, it puts it in front of my PlayStation where I normally play. But then I had the big media thing because I think at the moment, I was, at that moment, sorry, I was watching like house tours. I love interior design and, you know, everything, the like architecture and everything. And I was watching that big content because I really wanted to see the details in their homes and talk about the architecture. And whenever I would be paying attention to the TV, I would, I would of course, just pause the game, guys. It's... Uh, I can't do two things at once. Uh, but yeah, so I would just have that on the big TV and then I just had this in my hand because again, I just needed to make a couple of inputs once in a while. And then whenever they were talking about something where they would just show a random B-roll, but not some, they are not showing something specific to the part of the video that they're talking about, I could then just continue gaming. And that was super enjoyable. And again, hours upon hours, I spent that way. Um, another thing is that, you know, I'm often... Um, on phone calls with people from overseas because I have family overseas and it's good to be able to talk to them and have this so yeah I've been using it a lot in the past week and I am super satisfied I think when in my initial impressions I said that a sweet price for this would be $150 I take that back I think this is fully worth the $200 um, that it costs I just think that it should come with a screen protector already applied at least a plastic one to protect your screen and then you can then remove that and choose to upgrade to like a tempered glass one just in case you're kind of more worried about you know things actually falling on it and maybe breaking the screen so yeah it's great it's a solid feeling device it's well performing it does one thing and it's really really good at doing that one thing it's a uh, compared to like a phillips screwdriver i have a really nice screwdriver set ish you know um, and I don't use those a hundred percent of the time, you know, like I'm not a tradie. I don't work in an environment that requires me to use my tools every day, but whenever I'm setting up a piece of furniture or I'm fixing something around the house, I'm really, really glad for the quality of the tools that I have. And I feel like this is a little bit like the portal. I don't use it every single week. Like I've had it for about, let's say 12 weeks or so. Um, I haven't used it every, every once of those 12, like every single one of those 12 weeks, I didn't use it but i did use it a few times and then the few times that i did use it it was a right tool for the job like i really really was glad it is such an upgrade from using the little razor kishi things where you like put a strap on onto the phone and then you can kind of hoodwink your phone and nah nah that that is whew, that was a hard life boy <laughs> that was a hard life that that is not anything yet comparable to the experience so yeah I really enjoyed the portal. Um, it also got an update, uh, which gave one thing that I was really glad for, and is that it now puts the battery indicator percentage, if you choose to, in the top corner there. Because before you only had the three bars, and those were okay, but you know, a single bar could be anywhere from like, you know, the first bar would be what, between 100% and maybe 60%. And there's a huge difference between those two values. So the fact that I can actually surface the actual percentage of battery there, that is cool. Oh, one more thing. It does have a little bit of um, sleep battery drain. So if you just put the, if you just, you know, kind of hit the lock button and you put the device in sleep mode and then you put it in your case and then you, you know, kind of put it away in a drawer. If you come back a week later, there's most likely going to be fully discharged. So if you're going to kind of leave it alone for more than like, let's say 10 or 12 hours, I definitely recommend just turning off the device. It will keep its full battery or whatever battery percentage that you were on and it will hold this battery much better that way. So then when you turn it back on, you'll be back in business. And it only takes about a minute to turn on the device itself and about 30 ish seconds to connect to your PlayStation, assuming that it was in rest mode. So within two minutes, you're back in business and that is a much better trade. So yeah, just one thing. Uh, if you've got your port PlayStation portal right now, it's not plugged in and you haven't touched it in a week and you're thinking to yourself, oh, I'm going to go on this trip and I'm going to be using my portal or whatever. Just make sure that you actually turn off the device fully so that it keeps its charge or you'll have to charge it at some point before your actual play session. 
So that's it. That's everything I wanted to say about the PlayStation Portal. That's my quick update for you guys. Because I think I promised you one, but I didn't want to make one like two weeks later. I wanted to use it more naturally. Uh, and then to see how it fit into my life. So yeah, really happy with this device. And really happy with the case and the kind of mini ecosystem uh, that it had. And I'm glad that it doesn't have too many things. You know, it doesn't have the like, SD cards to worry about. You don't have a lot of big accessories that need to go around the device in order to make it function the way that it should. Mm. Okay, now we're going to do something different. We are going to talk about the IGN interview with Phil Spencer. And we're also going to talk about the GameIndustry.biz interview with um, Sean Layden. These are two things that I was super interested in when uh, the conversation first surfaced. But I haven't watched either interview. And I thought about doing it in different ways. I thought, you know what, I could watch the interview and then surface that are the three key points I want to talk about. But that will require me to watch the interview anyway. And you know what? You might as well be a part of the process. So this is going to be a long video, okay? I know it's already been long just talking about the portal. So it's been at 25 minutes. But we're definitely going to talk about each interview. We're going to watch each um, as we go. One thing is that um, I have sped up the interview or the audio by about 1.25. I find that I find I'm more comfortable to listen to. So it will mean that we kind of save a little bit of time. But... Of course, I'll be pausing and giving my comments along the way. So if you're in for that, great. If you're not in for that, I guess I'll just talk, talk to you later because uh, I'm not going to make separate videos. My goodness, I'm not my YouTuber. Like, what are we doing here? Okay, uh, let's, uh, let's, let's, let's get started. Wow, that sounds so loud in my ears. Sorry, sorry. I think that's just my volume. I think, I think on streaming, it just sounds okay. You know what? Let me just knock that down a bit. We got a brand new... Xbox game showcase yeah. from Phil Spencer and his team featuring a yeah. ton of reveals. Well done, Phil Spencer. Great showcase. I uh, just want to say great showcase, 10 out of 10 showcase. I've said it before, I said it again. It was a 10 out of 10 showcase. Some things they could have done better. They definitely should have made all of the games that they showed one on this one and captured on the Series X. That would have been the best way to do it. But happy with the showcase. Okay, I'm not going to take a point off. Okay, because 10 out of 10 is not perfect. Talk about so. Who better to talk about the present and future of Xbox? Then the Ryan McCaffrey himself. <laughs> they want to hear from you, my friend, not me. <laughs> Phil Spencer, thank you and welcome to IGN Live. Thanks, thanks, Ryan. Yeah, thanks. okay. This stage, move. I think you just had the best showcase you've ever had. I really mean, I said it before you got here. Thank you, Ryan. Actually, this is true. I think this has been the best showcase that they've ever had, 100%. Um, well, I, I think, like, I, I don't even know if I got all my points out last time. One of the key things is that I believe that these games are going to come within the next two years. A lot of these games are going to come within the next two years. Now, one criticism of the showcase has been that it has been um, at least six or seven titles were repeats from 2020. But I didn't score the 2020 showcase high because I didn't think those titles were believable back then that they were going to come soon. Now that they've been brought back, okay, so I guess it's like a remaster. <laughs> <laughs> we have remastered showcases, right? Uh, but now that they've been brought back, this is the right time to show them. So I'm going to give them the full points. So I think the 2020 showcase for me was like a 3 out of 10. Especially that Halo Infinite showcase. Oh god, that was so awful. 3 out of 10 at best. Because they had like Everwild that was like a standout. But then look what happened to that, right? Uh, but this showcase, like I said, much better timing. You know, most of the games I think are coming within the next two years. And that is the right window to show those games so yeah 10 out of 10 showcase much better this time around it really was fantastic it was now, fantastic i know you plan these things months and months no, it's looking pretty good they like until our fans the customers you guys give us the feedback like mm. aaron greenberg and i were talking about this two weeks ago now the thing that probably hit me the oh most he's got dimples was obviously just the passion of the teams of putting their amazing work on stage and seeing so many teams do great work but it was based i'd say two months ago when I just looked at the kind of scale of the franchises, yeah. how much work the teams were doing to show up the way they did and the partners that we had in the show. Like I was, I was in awe of the show. See, this is the thing that I like about Phil Spencer. He always gives props to his teams, to the teams that work with him, to the partners that work alongside him, to the global partners. I think it's so great because unfortunately, um, I think American culture loves a they love a standout fig like figure like like you are you are the spearhead you are the face of the company they love that um and i think that's super problematic 
Uh, so it's a good thing that he uses some of that lim limelight to cast it back upon, you know, the people that are working with him, name dropping Aaron Greenberg, name dropping Sarah Bond, name dropping all the people that he works with. Uh, because yeah, I, I wouldn't, I, I, I would find it so egotistical if he accepted all that praise for himself and he didn't give it back to his team. So definitely a great move. Also, he's, he's put on, you know, he's put on a bit of weight, you know, it's good to see him that he's eating, you know, I think he's going to those black African restaurants around him, you know, eating that good food. He's looking, he's looking solid. I like that. There's a couple games I want to ask you about specifically before we'll talk about some other stuff too. But um, the, the one that I, I said, right, for me, uh, of all the great stuff from today, South of Midnight? stole the show for me was something I wasn't expecting to see today again, which was Perfect Dark. I knew you were going to say that. Nah. Perfect Dark. Yeah. Perfect dark really? And first person, spy, espionage, some parkour, a little Mirror's Edge in there, yeah, which I yeah. love. Um, all playable, like all in game. Yeah. Somebody. And that game's been cooking for a long time. Yeah. That we followed the, the partners at Crystal have been doing amazing and work that's, there. Yeah, Crystal was brought in to help it keep going. So what has it been like for you to kind of follow the very long trajectory of that game from, you know, it, it started with, with Daryl Gallagher starting a studio. And Just now, down the street. Yeah, and now we're <laughs> finally here. Like, so how, is, how has it been kind of getting to this point with Perfect Dark? Yeah, you know, in parallel, building a studio while you're building a game and something that Perfect Dark back to N64 and obviously us with BDZ on 360. Like there's just such anticipation for that game and I... Okay, so one thing that was going on in this is that the people at IGN were artificially asking the crowd to cheer um, and they were giving them prizes for like making the most noise and being the most hype and everything. Um, that definitely comes out in this interview and I think it makes that talk so much more fake um, I, I wish they wouldn't do that next time. Just let people have natural reactions, good or bad. But just let it be something where people feel like, oh yeah, this isn't artificial, this isn't forced. Because every time I hear that crowd cheer, a few of them are genuine and you can tell, especially at like the beginning, that was more, I'm sure it was prompted, but it was a more natural reaction. Like, yeah, let's get it, let's get it started, you know. And most of these people do like Phil Spencer, right? Um, but again, like sometimes he just says like fairly regular things and people are like, oh wow, yeah, ah. it's just like, boy, it's, it feels like, you know, like a porn actress on like, I don't know, blacked, <laughs> you know, it's just like, we know you're just doing too much. You're faking it too much, boy. I really appreciate everybody's patience because we've been talking about this for a long time. And like my team can verify this. When I saw it, I said, this is the one that Ryan's going to love because <laughs> we know his love for spy. And I said, this is the one, you know, <laughs> I'm sorry, but <laughs> I know that this is, you know, this is showmanship and, and there is that element. But if you genuinely were seeing this showcase and you were like, this is the one that Ryan McCaffrey from IGN is going to love, boy, that is so problematic on so many levels. So I just hope that this part is showmanship because there's this incestuous culture that, um, you know, Xbox has with like media, especially IGN. And I just find it so problematic on so many levels. So I definitely do hope that this is just like a fun anecdote for showmanship purposes. And this isn't anything close to the truth that he was doing. Look at this showcase, seeing years of work that his teams have put into it. And he's like, you know what? Why are going to like this? <laughs> And just so proud of the team, um, and it, it really just came together so well. And I mean, a cool little story, um, Daryl had our other studio heads down at the studio just yesterday and walked through that same section yeah. in-game nice. to show them like, this is a game being played. And I, I love seeing our community of creators coming together that way. Well, another- uh, the, the Don't you know everything was in-game, being played? Was it but being played on what? Mm? Being played on the Xbox or being played on PC? Mm, come on guys like you have a console i know that you are part of the microsoft ecosystem but you don't make any other hardware for pc so you know i mean i guess you could make the surface i mean if it was playing on the surface i guess that's one thing say that but um you know playing on what you know is was this captured what was it captured on be upfront and be transparent about those things that would be so so far because when sony shows the things they tell you where they've captured it okay i think 99 percent times on ps5 but if it's ever on pc it says it right there the new gears of war game but it, it wasn't uh, it wasn't gear six it was not it was it not, was not. six so what well, you know that's a good surprise you have a visibility into everything but but i'm curious when you're in a meeting with maybe it's matt booty maybe it's alan hartman but the coalition folks like 
when you learn that they've gone down the E-Day road, the yeah. prequel road, rather than Gears, like, what was your reaction when, when you found out that that was going to be the next direction for Gears of War? Well, you know this. We, we've had some changes in leadership at the studio. Rod, who was there, is now leading Diablo for us. So I actually thought, a Diablo game I'm playing a ton of, I thought it was a nice opportunity for that team to establish their Gears. Right, and going on following on Gears 5, just because the numerical thing, like I think it would just, it, this was an opportunity for them to take it back to an origin story yeah. that I know you know, that has a lot of like real depth to it in terms of Emergence Day, um, and tell that story through the coalition as it is today. I thought, like, what a great opportunity. I was excited. And then we, you probably saw, I know you heard it, the Mad World tune in the oh, play yeah. piece. Oh yeah. Like for those of us who remember the 360 commercial, like how iconic was that? So when they went back and sourced that and brought that through the piece, I think it just showed that they, they, they kind of, Stay true to what Gears is, but tell a new story, new arc. Now, you're wearing a very cool Xbox Pride shirt today, but a year ago at the Xbox Showcase, you freaked out people like me by wearing a Hexen shirt. Okay, so this is a part of the interview that um, I don't really love. This whole, um, how do we how do we call it? This whole stardom around Phil Spencer, like where we, like, oh my God, you were wearing this today last year you were wearing that i'm just like no like let's get to the questions that matter you know yes his wardrobe choice is very gaming he's central like I, I guess at the end of the interview i wouldn't mind a more light-hearted topic but at the moment it's like this veneration like oh this look look phil spencer you're all this you're all that and i uh i, I don't like i don't appreciate that um at all so let's just skip just this because he, he doesn't care I, about this game. I see game. the reveal for Doom the Dark Ages, and I go, mm -hmm. well, wait a second. How awesome was that? Hold on. Are, like, are, are Great you reveal. secretly making a hexagon Great reveal, game sorry. in the Doom universe? Because I know you and I <laughs> no, 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 remember Doom forward. 1 on a floppy going, my only PC that could run it was my PC right. at Microsoft. So I would sneak in at night, put it in so I could play. So the opportunity to stand there and get to announce a Doom and then Doom Dark Ages, which definitely yeah. has some hexen in it. Um, and I just thought, Hugo and the team, fantastic work. I'm so proud. Now, great, I can't great, help but bring up uh, something that's been a topic of conversation a lot recently, which is uh, that Doom the Dark Ages is also going to ship on PS5, something yeah. that you've done yeah. with some other games. So can you, can you from a business level... Okay. Um, yeah, so this, this one is a good question. Um, you know, we're going to put it on the PS5. Uh, before, when we, they got um, Bethesda, they told us that it was about putting exclusive games for Xbox gamers where, on platforms where Game Pass exists. So this answer should be interesting. Like, can you walk me through, you know, you paid seven and a half billion dollars to acquire Bethesda's NMX. So what, what's the calculus? Like, what's the, the process there for deciding like, okay, new Doom, let's keep it multi-platform as it has been, or rather than, or just put it on Xbox. So what's what's kind of the, the thought process there? Well, on Doom, it's definitely one of those franchises that has a history on so many devices. Yeah. I think they have like Doom running on a lawnmower somewhere uh, when you go back. But, um, and you know, it's a franchise that I think everybody deserves to play. Um, I'm really proud of what the team, and to be honest, like I was in a meeting with Marty and the team a couple of years ago, and I asked Marty what he wanted to do. Um, and he said he wanted to ship it on, on all platforms. I said, let's go do that. Like it was well, a yeah, I don't believe that. You know, like I, I don't, I don't believe that um, you would have not shipped it on PlayStation Five at the whim of you know whoever this Marty person is. You know, I guess he's like a game director or like the studio lead or whatever. Like if he had said the opposite, you would have just be like, yeah, okay, cool. We'll just leave it on Xbox, regardless of the financial realities around the project, how much it is costing, and you know everything like that. Um, again, it's it's one of these showmanship things. But I don't believe that, again, a, you know, like, if, if you want to ship on an additional platform, it's going to re require manpower, it's going to cost money, um, it's going to cost, you know, uh, fees, for example, you know, PlayStation with Kinect is going to take 30% of the cut and everything like that. Like, there is way more strategy than just being like, oh, yeah, you know, Maddie, just uh, toss a coin, you know, toss a coin to your Witcher. How, how, how do you read the tea leaves? Should we put it on PlayStation? Do you want to? Do you not feel like it? Do you want to put it on Switch but not on PlayStation for whatever reason? You know, like, ah, it's up to you. Like, again, I just I just wish that, you know, okay, it's fine. It's a show, right? So he's, he's putting on a front for the entertainment of the crowd, I suppose. So it is what it is. I mean, what else was he going to say? Was he really going to say, yeah, no, we like money and we've trained our customers to not pay for our games and we're putting this on Game Pass. So if we don't put it on other platforms, where are we going to get this money back from? Like, where is this going to happen? Like, he's not going to say those things. So I guess he said the best thing that could be expected of him to say. Well, is that now... I want to bring it back, though, 
because I get a lot of questions about, hey, if I'm an Xbox owner, what does it mean? And what I want to say, and I thought it... You know what it meant it just a few months ago? It meant that you were going to get these exclusive games for the Xbox console owners, and you were going to put them on platforms where Game Pass exists, meaning uh, PlayStation, no, not PlayStation, sorry, Xbox consoles, uh, PC, and I guess Samsung TVs. That's that's what it meant. But now, let's see what it means now. It showed up so well in the, the show today. You saw an amazing collection of games that are coming to Xbox. They're going into Game Pass day one. And Game Pass showed up so well. If you buy the game on our console, you get to play it on PC. You buy it on PC, you get it. So the cross entitlement stuff is all there. That you know, crowd reaction is so fake. Future it's so fake. With forward compatibility. Our commitment to our Xbox customers is you're going to get the opportunity to buy or subscribe to the game. We're going to support the game on other screens. And you are going to see more of our games on more platforms. And we just see that as a benefit to the franchises that we're building. Because you like money, bro. Because you just say the thing, bro. It's not even. Something thing to be ashamed of. Like, when do we start shaming companies for wanting money? Like, <laughs> just, just say it. And we see that from players, and the players love to be able to play. Well, uh, thank you. There you go. I, I have oh, to do the journalistically. The disappointment, the disappointment in, in Ryan McCaffrey's face, boy. It's just like, boy. You knew what the answer to this was before the fact. These are, these are scripted questions. Uh, these are things that Microsoft PR would have had to approve of. And these are things that, you know, c given your relationship with Phil Spencer, you knew the answer just before the show, but it still hits you. <laughs> like, we can tell this is not the first time that you're hearing what this answer will be, but it still hits you. You're like, oof. If these games were exclusive, the way that Xbox will be back up on the pedestal, bro, tell him that. Let him know, like, boy, you could be fighting. Anyways, it is what it is. You're disappointed. We're all disappointed. Bring the, bring the mood down. Otherwise, the, 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 the mood not down. Apart. So I wanted to ask you, you, you haven't really commented publicly much in the last couple months. So uh, I wanted to ask you about the studio closures and, and Tango Gameworks and some of the, you know, the, some of the thoughts behind the, okay. the decision making there. I mean, you had a, a, a so betrayed. He said, uh, Rush. You had, uh, Ryan, folks like Aaron Green I was thinking about you. We have perfect dark. The right things here. So, now you're asking me this uh, question? Like what? The walk fuck? Me through the, de the, the decision of <laughs> of why really Tango specifically, not to, not to disrespect See, look the at him. studios that that uh, look at his face. He's like, I was smiling a second ago. Now you're just now you're just like, who are you? You're dirt. You're nothing. How dare you ask me this question? Like I know it was scripted. I know it said, but how dare you? I can't believe you asked me this. <laughs> Your first person looks so like. It's you, brute. <laughs> Close, but that was the one that really seemed to kind of stick in the community's craw a bit. So uh, I'm hoping here that you can take the opportunity to, to address that closure and, and some of the recent changes in Xbox. Yeah, the closure of any team is hard, obviously, on the individuals there, hard on the team. And I try to spend all of my focus, as you said, I haven't been talking publicly about this, because right now is a time for us to focus on the team and the individuals. It's obviously a decision that's very hard on them, and I want to make sure through severance and other things that we're doing the right thing for the individuals on the team. It's not about my PR, it's not about Xbox PR, it's about those teams. In the end, I've said over and over, I have to run a sustainable business inside the company and grow, and that means sometimes I have to make hard decisions that frankly are not decisions I love, but decisions that somebody needs to go make. Um, we will continue to go forward. We will continue to invest in what we're trying to go do in, in Xbox and build the best business that we can, which ensures we can continue to do shows like the one we just did. On. Yeah, um, okay. That answer isn't a bad answer. At the end of the day, um, he does have to run a profitable business. I wish that he could tie it more to like the actual reason and be like, listen, Hi-Fi Rush wasn't profitable. Hi-Fi Rush wasn't the kind of game that was going to be supported by the community. Not on Xbox, not on PlayStation, not on PC. Hi-Fi Rush was a rhythm game, a rhythm game. I think it would have been better as a, um, as a Ratchet and Clank competitor. You know, something where it is a platformer, it is cartoony, it has its own like thing, you know, like what do we talk about with Ratchet and Clank? Besides Ratchet, we talk about the weapons, you know, the wacky weapons that you get to use. It would have been cool if there were like Sonic weapons, you know, like maybe he, co he collected different guitars. But aside from that, it wasn't a rhythm game at all, you know. Yes, it was still going to be like music based, but it could have been, you know, kind of like a planet hopping or like city expanding, pretty much a Ratchet and Clank competitor. I think that would have made it a more popular game.
I think that would have made it more financially profitable. Would it have been enough? I don't know. But at the end of the day, this is all about the money and the financials. They talk about how Hi-Fi Wash is a critical darling, but again, critical darling for whom? For people who feel like they want diversity, for people who feel like, oh, they want new ideas. But guess what? The mainstream population, the people that people call casuals in a derogatory way, they want big, bombastic games. They want games that are fun, not rhythm games. I'm sorry. Soundfall came out. You know, Soundfall is a is a third party game. Um, it's on PlayStation definitely, and it's definitely I think on other platforms as well. I don't think it's an exclusive in any way. But Soundfall came out, and it came out to a resounding. Eh, you know, people that are gonna give it a try are gonna give it a try. But most people are not gonna care about it. It's a rhythm game. Rhythm games are just not gonna sell, bro. Um, I don't know why people keep acting like surprised. They're like, oh, Phil, why'd you close Tango? It's so critically acclaimed. A again, critically acclaimed by whom? By the same media personalities that was telling Xbox, you're doing such a great job, and then they have to close Tango. Boy, come on, let's be honest. Let's have some honesty in our discourse. Uh, on the, you know, the, the Activision Blizzard saga, you know, that's, that's all been, that probably made you put saga. Well, I don't know, did, did it, 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 from just from covering it and watching it, it felt yeah. like it put like five years on my life yeah. as somebody that covers Xbox. I can't imagine how it was for you. But as that came to a close uh, and you started integrating them into Activision Blizzard King, into Xbox Studios, ha has that changed the way that you think about running the business at all? With Because the, the organization just got quite a bit larger, like yeah. almost overnight in, in a sense. Um, no, I mean, we're still, and I, I hope we show this today, we're going to be about building great games for people to play, about giving them choice on Xbox. I hate this. I hate this answer. He always says this. It's, it's, his, um, it's his bad signal. You know, it's his calling card. Uh, what, what is it? Uh, building great games uh, where you can choose to play on the devices that you choose, in the ways that you choose, the people that you choose. It's that. It's great games, devices, friends ways people that <laughs> like he just gives you <laughs> you know like he just samples different arrangements from those particular elements and then that's pretty much his entire answer it's a non-answer now you know like i'm not sure if it was a great question by ryan anyway like has he changed the business again is this something that he's going to give us a genuine answer to it yes it has changed the business because it is a post abk acquisition that we now see this commitment to put games everywhere you know, before it was in a case-by-case -case basis. Now it's like, no, you're going to get more games and more games. And just recently, you know, after this interview, um, we had who? Matt Booty, I think, talk about how um, all of these games on Xbox are going to definitely launch as exclusives. But then, you know, from the phrasing, we can see that they will eventually go everywhere. And, you know, Portal Rock has said, you know, for the longest, and we've got to give him credit for st sticking by his guns. And he said that, the main you know denomination is going to come down to the resources that each team has available to it as to how quickly they can put the game on playstation 5. certain studios that were bought by microsoft already had the talent built in to make their games in a multi-platform way because that's what they used to do that was in their dna so they already have the teams there to handle the ports to other platforms playstation and a lot of them also will be porting to Switch, or I guess they will acquire people to port to Switch. So that will be the delay. But other teams, you know, that had never put a game on PlayStation before, or that hadn't done it in a long time, they are going to need to go through a process of reacquiring that talent, of rededic rededicating resources to that particular, you know, endeavor. So just say that. <laughs> just say that we, we have work to do and but they will eventually get there box to go play we've got a broader library of games the thing i'm starting to see which i really love is the organic collaboration between our teams that are coming out um, and trying to build that community of creators that i mean you and i will go back to the time of xbox where we basically had four games fable forza gears halo and we by the way it was three games okay no one ever counted fable as part of them because when was the last time you released a fable how often did you release fable come on it was three games. It was Halo Gears Forza. Um, but quickly there, he says that they are just starting to build this community of creators and themselves. And I'm like, boy, you've been at this for 20 years, though. What do you mean you're just starting to make like network networks? 
what? Come on. You're talking like you're like a... You're talking as if you were in the Xbox original era where you basically just came out and maybe four or five years down the line, you're like, yeah, creators are now starting to sign on board. That would be a perfectly reasonable thing to do. But this is 20 years later, dude. How can you still be at like step three? You know? Like, ugh. Which is literally every four years. And I would have to come to E3 and I'd somehow try to make those four games seem different every year. For I like the way he just pretty much admitted like he was talking bullshit before. So it's good to know that four years from now, he'll be telling us, oh, remember when I sat down and I told you strange it wasn't TNG? <laughs> of course it was. The community. Um, and now what we have in, in gaming is just an amazing collection of, t of teams and franchises that are doing great work. So I think, you know, I, I feel an added responsibility as somebody who loves this industry for the franchises that show up on our stage. Uh, but I still think in the end, it's about putting... See, I think if you love the industry, you have to do away with that whole requirement where uh, Microsoft as a whole corporation puts a lot of value into hiring contractors that can only stay for 18 months at a time. Because these projects are long-term projects, you know. And when we take a look at things that disavowed, you know, we, we, we can see that something's gone wrong between the original vision that we were pitched and the result that we got. And how much of that has to do with that whole, you know, you are taking a set of developers that were just getting comfortable and just getting in the element. And at the 18-month mark, you're saying, hey, you can't stay here, not for another six months, you can't be here. We're going to hire someone new. Then I has to take another six months to get re-acclimatized. Another six months after that, you really start, you know, digging the teeth into the project. And then just when they're about to do the peak body of work, you know, the, the best when they are hitting it every day, they, they know the cubicle, they know the people, they know their relationships, you know, they know the kind of coffee that they like, <laughs> you know. Now you say, hey, listen, you need to leave as well. So, yeah. I think if you love the industry, you have to fix it from within Microsoft. You have to stop looking outward and say, what is our influence out there? And you have to say, okay, what is our influence in here, in-house? What are we doing? How can we make things better for our creators? You know, now we have the big debate and we'll talk about it more in the Sean Layden um, interview. But over AI, how is Microsoft going to handle AI when Satya Nadella wants to push AI with Copilot Plus onto every custom consumer that they have of their operating system? How is that going to actually affect the people, the creators making the games? You know, are you going to have a boss like Satya that is super AI, I guess, positive? And then is it going to then say, listen, uh, since we already are replacing people every 18 months, um, we are going to now do a more drastic integration of AI tools or AI use or AI generation in our gaming sector as well. You know, how are you going to insulate your teams from some of those um, policies? that Microsoft as a corporate may want to do, but that are diametrically opposed to the creative nature of your particular subdivision. You know, I really want Phil Spencer to focus on what he is doing. I just, I hate the fact that he tries to speak for an industry that he controls not even a third of, because again, when we're talking about gaming, we have to bring in the people like Apple and Google and Sony and Nintendo, you know, by then it's like you are just as you are just like a little, you know, like maybe you are like what eight to twelve, maybe even twenty percent of the market, depending on how you delineate that. But you are a small slice of the pie, and it would be great if you were like a spearhead for actually treating your developers better. Amazing games out. Like I'm really proud of the work that Ninja Theory did with Hellblade and how Hellblade's been the response to that. No, you haven't. No, you aren't. No one. No one is part of Hellblade too. That's focused no on one, us doing a bunch not of one person. As an example, um, and then you see things like South of Midnight, which might have been my game of the show. I thought it looked It so is good. the game of the show. Um, you got perfect dark. Uh, you have but gear. this whole stop motion thing again. I don't like the stop motion thing. I think we will look better without the stop motion. It is a unique visual flair, but. I don't know. I don't know. We have to wait for the game to come out before I can make a judgment on that. Maybe it's something you just get used to. But man, I don't... You know? It's one of those things where like... It's being different better. Like I feel like this is one day where they're like, Oh, we did this to be different. But is it better? We'll see. So like for us, as the organization gets bigger, I think it's just more important that we can take bets together. Uh, and try to do innovative, creative things, um, and that will continue to drive us.
All right, well, we've got to take a very quick break, but we've got lots more. Phil Spencer talking all things Xbox right here on IGN Live. Okay. That's, uh... we'll have so much more. It's changed dramatically. It has. Dramatically. No yeah. Uh, just in the past few years. And so on the, on you know, with the, when you make a, a, a 70, almost $70 billion acquisition, do, do you start hearing from your bosses more? Or are they still staying out of your way and letting you run the business? Because that's, you know, that's not an insignificant amount of money to spend on It's definitely not an business. insignificant amount of money. No, I, the support we get from the company, and my boss is the CEO of Microsoft, Satya Nadella. Hey, Satya. Um, yeah, you know, Satya. We are given a ton of leeway <laughs> so to go and run and grow our business. But I'll say the thing that we challenge ourselves to do is to try to do new things. Like, I think if I go back eight years ago, we said, hey, we're gonna go ship all of our games on PC and console, and if you buy one on one, you get it on the other. And I got some like reaction from people of, this is the worst decision ever, like this is gonna be the end of Xbox. I mean, yeah. <laughs> Evidently. <laughs> Evidently, yeah. You, you are doing worse now with your console than you did back in the, you know, like Xbox 360 era. Now it's like in some places, like in France, it just came out that you're losing to like the Xbox original. Like this is the worst generation you've had. Yeah, people were right. You didn't get some reactions. You got some salient warnings. You got some predictions, some precognition that this is not good. And it hasn't been good. <laughs> and then you compounded it. With the next thing you're about to talk we about. We announced Game Pass, and we started doing Game Pass. And I know some people looked at that and said, oh, you're going to teach people that games are free. Um, and you, you have taught people that games are free. Like, why do you make it? Like, why is the tone of your voice insinuating that the opposite happened when those things did come true? Hello? Like, bro, you changed consumer behavior on your platform to the level where developers are now coming out loud and saying, hey, if you don't have a Game Pass, a Game Pass deal, don't even bother putting it on the Xbox. You're not going to see the return on investment. Why are you like saying it like, oh, well, we really showed them, buddy. Like, no, is <laughs> that's exactly what happened. Number one, the PC thing reduced the need and reduced the identity of your console. Therefore, you are selling less consoles. And then the Game Pass thing reduced the purchases on Xbox platform specifically and third parties are now skipping your platform. Bro, this happened like a week ago. Like, <laughs> we're not in a different reality now. It's not like this was like happening back in like, I don't know, 2018. And you were saying this, like, oh yeah, no, preliminary, you know, preliminary indications are telling us that the opposite will happen. But then, you know, seven years later, oh, you know, I, I guess we were well. Okay, no, no, you happen, you happen. This is happening after you can see the data. So it's like, bro, stop pretending with your tone. Because then he, he does this, yeah? He pretends with his tone. You can see the way he's insinuating that there's a difference. But then look at what he says next. You're going to undermine the value in games. And what I can say sitting here today from our decisions on cloud, on Game Pass, on console, mm -hmm. like right now, we have more Xbox console users than we've ever had in the history of Xbox. Okay. That has nothing to do with the price of salt. That has nothing to do with it. Nothing to do with it. You having more Xbox console users, first of all, what is that data? Is this like more active users every month compared to what? Okay, is it like, are, are you doing the Xbox series consoles by themselves compared to like the Xbox One consoles, compared to the Xbox 360 consoles, compared to the OG Xbox consoles? Or are you doing like the Xbox... Like you're saying like, oh, in 2024, as an overall part of our business, our console users are higher. But then that will mean that you are combining anyone who is still on the 360, anyone that is still on the Xbox One, and anyone that is now on the Xbox series. And you're saying that cumulatively, that, that total, which is higher than any other total, like every other previous year when you added all of those up, you were lower than you are now, which is like, yeah, that's true and that's easy to do. But that is not like a metric that somehow absolves you of the claims that you were just trying to refute with your tone. You didn't refute them. You didn't say, hey, that didn't happen. Those things are still true. So it's, why are you, that has nothing to do with it. It's a completely different, like, and also this is a useless point. You're saying that you have um, more console users now. Again, you said console users. You didn't say we have more 
consoles users using the series comes like, like like you know you didn't commit it's a fluffy statement that really doesn't take us far as soon as we look at it critically for like three seconds it doesn't say anything I guess. and even when i look at things like the impact of game pass because i watch that and i love game pass like how it showed up in the show today i think was fantastic but we also want people to be able to buy games so i go back and i look and i say okay over the last five years what's happened to third-party game yep. or game sales on our platform we're on we're up double digits every year over the last five years on game sales on xbox okay that is a much better stat okay over the last five years when you look back you are up double digits the problem is <laughs> Percentages, okay? Single digit percentages are only from zero to nine. Then double digits are from 10 to 99. So which double digit? You could be up 11%, which is okay. This is fine. Or you could be up 75%, which is great. Which one is it? <laughs> you just saying double digit percentage doesn't say much because percentage range. <laughs> Oh man, listen, this is, this is, um, I like that though. I, that's a really clever way to put it. Like it's a way of saying something that really sounds like you're trying to say something like your point is really salient until a person thinks about it for a little bit longer than three seconds and it's like, but you have no precision in what you're trying to say. But the way you say it, the bombastic nature, the, the, the way that you're so dismissive even, you're like, yeah, we showed them. Bore. Hey, you know what? I like this one. I like this one. I like it when I have to engage my brain to detect the bullshit. Box consoles. So when I look at it, I will just, you know, doing a $70 billion acquisition will push us to try to do more. It'll push us on cloud. It'll push us to go find customers in new places, continue to think about access to amazing games, enabling creators to do great work. But I actually think for the team, that's just a self-motivation that the team has, and it's fun to be a part of. Why so listen, just one more thing um, uh, quickly about um, the 70 billion acquisition. I think in our community, okay, not talking about the, the interview, in our community where we have a little bit of discourse around gaming and the gaming industry, we throw that number out, but we don't realize that that number is incomplete. And what I mean by incomplete is that was the original purchase. As soon as you make that acquisition, it's a bit like buying a car. As soon as you bring that car home, you are now in charge of its maintenance, of its upkeep, you know, of its running costs, um, of its insurance. You know, there's a lot more costs, you know, that go around owning the car now because now it's your responsibility to give it all that it needs in order to keep serving you in the way that you would like to. So, you know, and, you know, if you want to do any modifications, that is, again, all on you. So the, the equivalent there for the reality of Microsoft buying ABK and Bethesda and all of those is that they now have to pay all of those salaries, all of those insurances, they have to pay for all of those buildings, they have to pay for all of those computers, all that electricity. They have to, you know, all of these artists and the contracts and the legal and, you know, NDA, all of that now becomes their responsibility. You know, so yeah, you pay the 70 billion to acquire it, but it doesn't then magically keep itself running, you know, without input from you. It's probably costing them, I don't know, it could be something close to, you know, a few, a significant fraction of a billion dollars every year to keep all of those personnel running. That's why they had so many layoffs, you know, like they laid off like what, 1900 people the last time and Microsoft laid like 10, like again, there's reasons for layoffs that do not have to do with the fact that it's a purchase in itself, but <laughs> do not be surprised that they are trying to downsize some of those teams because if they can have, let's say they acquired an, a personnel and now across all of the worldwide studios, let's give it a figure. Let's say they have 6,000 developers that work on across all of their teams. If they could reduce that number to 3,500, that is not an insignificant amount of money. That is a lot of money, especially if you project that each game will take about five years um, before you get the ones that are going to give you a great return on investment. Now, when you start multiplying that, you can start to see why they are doing cutoffs. So yeah, over here, we always say, you know, oh, they, they made a $70 billion purchase. No, it's closer to a $100 billion purchase. When you took on ABK over the next 10 years, um, yeah, it could easily cost you, you know, way closer to a hundred billion, you know, 80 billion definitely uh, because of all of the personnel and all of the staff and all of the buildings and all of the electricities and all of the insurances. And, you know, I think in the US, um, it is the employer that is, 
responsible for like healthcare benefits and things like that, bro, <laughs> it's an expensive thing to be running. And I think that is one of the things, the points that Sean Layden has made before. Like he basically says to build a game, we have a warehouse of people basically there like day in day out you have 400 or 500 developers that are under you and whether that they're at the beginning of the project or whether the project really needs all of the all hands on 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 board or towards the tail end of the project where most people are moving on to other things you're keeping the same warehouse of people yes you have satellite people that you bring in and out of the project but he's like here's this warehouse that you have to pay for all of the time and that makes it super expensive well microsoft bought like an Amazon, you know, like like an Amazon collection of warehouses, you know, that they have to keep up and running at all the time, 24 seven. That's expensive. It's way more than just $70 billion for the purchase. I got six day one game pass. Blacked out for six day, right? Like, so I would people imagine. said I wouldn't do that. <laughs> yeah, most people in this room have probably been used to spending 60, 70 bucks on it every year. Now, if they're already subscribing to game pass and good to go. But, but if they are not, they pay more on it. So, hmm. I've talked about it before. I've talked about the, the dilemma that all of these subscription services face. But yes, if you were already super happy with Game Pass, this has been nothing but a value add for you. All of that show is literally just value dumped into your lap for free. Okay, I know that Game Pass itself isn't free. But the point is, if you were happy to pay for Game Pass at X amount of value, and then Y amount of value is added on top of that that y amount if it doesn't cost you any more than you were going to pay for anyway that is free extra value there's no other way around it that's a huge problem for businesses but it is free extra value so you know what it's a great time it's a great time if, if you were if you're going to be part of game pass anyway it's a great time for you to be celebrating but it's a choice like if we didn't say to anybody you have to subscribe right. to play if you want to buy black ops it's great it's, it's great for us it's great for the developer if you want to subscribe it's also great like i want to give you the choice on how you play your games and who you play with and not try to do slimy platform things to force you to do what i want you to do give the players choice and what they want to do and who they play with so okay so that that there i think is one of those lines that you just shouldn't have said um, the whole slimy platform thing, it seems like a shot across the bow at PlayStation or Nintendo. It seems to talk about exclusivity and basically being able to say to the customer like, hey, this is where this product is available. And if you want access to this product, this is, these are the pathways that will take you there. But other than, other than that, it's a, it's, a, it's a give it or take, it's a, it's a take it or leave it situation. That's not slimy. If you want a Big Mac, you go to McDonald's, right? They're the ones that make Big Macs, right? I don't, I don't go to McDonald's. <laughs> yes, they are. They are. The Whopper is the Hunger Jacks one or the uh, Burger King. That's why you guys have it in the in the United States. And most of my audience that watches is from the US. Hey guys, uh, you guys have a wonderfully calamitous country. Calamitous, calamitous. Point to calamities. You guys have tornadoes and stuff. I don't know how you survive. But the point is this, okay? You have burger king with their particular line of burgers you have mcdonald's with their lines of burgers and no one has ever found it problematic that that's what they offer as well as this these franchises have exclusive drinks right like i think over here anyway hungry jacks can only sell like i think the pepsis and the um you know, it's Pepsi, Pepsi is a sun kiss and that kind of like the PepsiCo pretty much uh, drinks. And then McDonald's gets the Coca-Cola drinks, right? Which are better, of course they are. Um, and then that's what they serve. So even with third party drinks, right? Those franchises have exclusivity deals. That's how the world works. You know, like it's okay. It's not a slimy thing. It is a different decision. It's a decision that Xbox used to make and now they are choosing not to make it. Until again, you read what my buddy said, where he said, these games are going to launch as exclusives. So he keeps saying, give the players choice, but you're not putting South of Midnight on PlayStation 5 day one. So it's like, you're still doing it. So it's just one of those things where it's like, you lose, lose, no matter how it is a person interprets it. In one case, you seem like spiteful and bitter that you lost to the exclusivity um, angle. Or in another way, you seem hypocritical because you still have exclusives regardless yourself. So it is what it is. Just shouldn't have said it. So the, 
the Activision Blizzard thing, you know, we watched it play out uh, in in courtrooms and regulatory With places. my tie on. Yeah, like, <laughs> I, I'm curious, what, what was the biggest unexpected challenge for you and the team at Xbox during the course of that? You know, for the management team, like Sarah Bond. I don't know what the point of this question is. It's already happened. It feels a little bit too much like, hey, Phil, you did this incredibly tough thing. Tell us how hard it was on you. Like, what are we going to get as gamers from from this? Like, what what substance is, is going to be given to us from hearing this answer? I don't know. Let, let's see how we go. And Lori Wright, Linda Norman, who's our lead lawyer at Xbox. Like the distract, we all I like the fact he gives names of running Xbox and doing the things that we needed to go do, Matt Booty. But then we actually added like the second job in the time of having to work through regulatory. And I didn't like it, it's it's my fault as the head of the business. I didn't really internalize that in the beginning of what a drain that would be on the team. And I think we saw that. I think we saw it in our execution on a couple things that we were doing, multiple things at a time that we hadn't planned for. And I'll say it's really nice to be post the acquisition, working with those amazing teams. I mean, I, I, how they showed up in our show today, fantastic. Right? I just thought it was great. I mean, we had World of Warcraft in an Xbox show. Like, it's just crazy. What, was then, there ever a point in the process? Because it, it really, between the CMA and the FTC and, and all these places, was there ever a point where you thought, oh, this might, this might not happen? Like, this might get, get uh, rejected? Well, we always have to plan for all contingencies. Yeah. Like, we consider everything. Like, it, you have to in running the business. But we felt like we were on the side of right. Like, in a, meaning we weren't doing this so we could pull Call of Duty from PlayStation players. It was never in our plans. I mean, I think my whole inbox leaked on the internet. So if anybody <laughs> wanted to find that that was the plan, you would find it somewhere. And it wasn't there. So we believed we were on, in the right on getting this deal done. <laughs> I mean, he talks about his, the, the email leaks. And one of your leaks was literally that you could spend Sony out of business. I mean, come on, we're not going <laughs> to... We're not forgetful. Like, we know these things, right? Your plan was, should you have had it your way? Should you have not had as much regulatory pushback? Would you have had um, the legal framework to be able to choose at a later date to put Call of Duty exclusive? Like that would have been something, a weapon that you would have dangled over PlayStation. That literally was, you know, Jim Bryan's um, issue with you having, you know, this Call of Duty thing. And remember that the agreement between Sony and PlayStation, uh, so Sony and Xbox, as far as Call of Duty is concerned, is just 10 years, you know? Yes, 10 years is a long amount of time, but after 10 years, you get to have that knife back. You can dangle that sword again, you know, over the neck of PlayStation, and you can be like, hey, if you don't give us this, or if you don't give us that, we will take Call of Duty away. That's why PlayStation is a bit more aggressive towards pursuing other live service revenues, because they know that they don't want to be in a position where they're going to be negotiating on the back foot. Yes, it is a huge time window where they are quote unquote safe from that happening. But after that, hey, listen, I actually hope you use it as a weapon. I actually do. That in year 11, you're like, hey, you know what? This Call of Duty thing, that's ours for like the next six months. Or we are going to give our, our players this pack and this thing or that you know because he came before um at the start of the actual showcase he said like or at the end whatever at one point in the showcase phil spencer said that call of duty will have everything the same across all of the platforms that are supported and i'm like yeah because those were your agreements like that wasn't a choice that you made that's what you agreed to but year 11 year 12 boy like i wouldn't be surprised if you were like hey listen all of that, that's on BS. We're going to give ourselves this exclusive thing, this exclusive battle pack, or this other advantage that are going to draw people into Xbox. And by the way, if you haven't thought of that yet, you definitely should, because that's the thing that you should do. Um, so we stayed convicted, but there were dark days. Like, with a, you know, when the CMA came out and said, no, this isn't going to go through. And, you know, the, the drag on the teams, the teams at Activision, Blizzard, and King, like, they're dealing with this uncertainty. So it's so nice to have it pass behind us, and now we can just focus on building great games together. You know, on that topic, like, we talk about all these huge changes to not just the industry, but again, specifically your business, the Xbox business over the last five or so years. What is today, like, as we sit here now, what's the thesis statement, what's the modus operandi for, for Xbox today, and how has it changed over the last five years? Yeah, and I, I see some of the feedback that our messaging from some people that maybe our messaging hasn't been consistent. And I always hear the feedback and I take it. Like, feedback is, is great. I will say from early on, we would say, when everybody plays, we all win. Like, how do we get in a place where everybody can play video games? And 
Oh, this crowd is so lame, bro. <laughs> also, why are they standing up? Like, <laughs> why couldn't you have seats for them? Like, this crowd is just the lamest, man. And you know what? I'm gonna, make, you know, I'm just gonna move past this. Different progress on PC now, like. PC is a huge business for us. We love that we have so many PC players, more than we've ever had. Our console is doing so well. But I think if you sit back... I hate those statements. You know, the ones that he's like, more than we've ever had. I'm like, but if you're talking about a cumulative total, you will always have more than you've ever had because you never take away those players that fall away. They're just... If someone ever uses... For example, I used PC Game Pass recently. That's why I paid. Uh, I played uh, Hellblade 2. So I am one of the players that did that but the thing is if you're just going to do a cumulative total there are going to be always more players that have played hellblade 2 10 years from now than they are that are playing today because there will just be more people that trickle in and out uh so that trickle in and they are counted but we don't we don't count the people that leave so saying that you have more players in and of itself it's it's mathematically futile basically and you try to frame this industry through the lens of the tradition of who sold a console today and that's the only solution to making gaming better i think you know xbox is doing something different than that we love our yeah but the thing is selling a console isn't about making gaming better bro <laughs> like it's not it's about having market share like we're not gonna oh, we're not gonna pretend that selling a console is about evangelizing the gaming industry like oh wow we sold a million playstation 5s now look devs are driving ferraris you know like oh all of these world problems are taken away climate change well that doesn't happen to game developers we sold a bajillion switches no <laughs> like it's not about that it's about gaining market share like at the same time that we shouldn't vilify you for not necessarily caring the most about your console we're also not going to like I don't know, evangelize PlayStation for selling more consoles than you. Those are both neutral things. They are both things that are targeted at doing business like, you know, moves and maneuvers and everything. PlayStation has an advantage over you for selling their consoles and you have an advantage over them for having a wider array of devices that you can potentially sell your products to. Neither of those things is good or bad or trying to like save the industry or make it better. They are just different ways of achieving market share. And that is perfectly fine. But it's so disingenuous to say like, oh, the only way to make the industry better is how many consoles you sell like that. You're trying to make it sound childish that consoles sales should be counted, but they absolutely should be counted. Just like, again, if you were to get a you know, a hundred million subscribers on PC Game Pass and they were active subscribers, not just a cumulative total of subscribers that had ever used a one dollar deal here or there, but active monthly subscribers on PC Game Pass, that should also be counted. Like Consoles. be honest. We love our PC players, but really it's about creators and players and amazing games coming to them. You see that it's always that creators, players, games. Games, 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 great games, great games, amazing games, amazing games, choose to play, where you play, choice, 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 devices this, devices that. <sighs> it's the same refrain, you know, it's just... Ugh. It has, admittedly for all of us, creators, players, it has been a, a weird generation because it started weird in this yeah. pandemic. And I'm curious, w would you do anything differently in this, in this Xbox series generation? If oh, you could kind of go back and, and tell yourself... <laughs> I'm not... Like, yeah. I'm not Game of the Series S. Ryan, that's what I would do. I give it a Series S, bro. I make an Xbox Series Digital X. Like we just, we just, Xbox Series X Digital, just like we just announced. And then I will have the one with the physical disc. And then that's what I would do. Just like PlayStation did. And it was tremendously successful for them, Ryan. And so that's what I would do. But let's see what he says. Not really a regrets guy. Like I don't like the yes, other decisions are. I make. That yeah, like in hindsight, maybe half of those wrinkles are regret data. wrinkles. But you gotta we, just we know. bet. You gotta bet on yourself and bet on the teams. That sounds like a person of what you're trying to do. When you get punched in the face, you get back up and you try to. Just... <laughs> when he says this, yeah. <laughs> when you get punched in the face, who punched you? <laughs> Your decisions punched you. That's why you have regrets. Wow, come on, man. Do things. 
So, like, I, I'm not really one who looks back and say, I wish I would have done this or that. Um, you know, I mean, you're in a position like this, you, you you're just, rich. You're team that we have. <laughs> you have to believe and you have to keep pushing forward. Okay, it's easier to do that when you are fading down. upwards. <laughs> It's easier to not reach. Like, okay, what would be the imperative for you to like regret your decision if you literally just keep fading upwards? You've been fading at Xbox for like the last ten years, and this motherfucker just keep promoting you ever and ever high. You will become the like, dude. One more failed generation, you'll be the CEO of Microsoft. Let's face it. Like, come on. Like, they keep promoting you for failing. Why would you actually regret it? I was wrong. I was wrong earlier. You can't be a regret person because you keep getting rewarded. For failing, you get more industry awards than anybody else, and yet you are literally the the you, okay. You are at the helm of the losing platform, but you get rewarded for your failures. So you know what? You're right. Why would you do anything different? If failure is give bringing you success, why would you wish for success? You're a smart man, Phil. You're a smart man. Kind of spoke to Game Pass a little bit and how you know how much of a value proposition it is, has increased after today even, but has the calculus changed on, on how much Game Pass subscriptions are valued at Microsoft versus direct sales? Like, you know, because now, it, when Game Pass started, it was, wow, this sounds really cool, and you've pledged to put every first party release in there, and at the beginning, there weren't a lot of those, but yeah. now you're almost, like, you had a whole show full of them, so kind of what's, how does, how does that metric for success, like, how does Game Pass influence the the success of the business. The thing I look at every morning is how many people played on our platforms and how long did they play. If they played through the... By the way, not an answer to the question. The question is, what has the thought process around Game Pass, its importance, its value to the company, its place in, in your calculus? How has that changed? And he's talking now about how he wakes up every morning and he looks at the general statistics of who is playing and how long they're playing for, regardless of the means, regardless of whether they're on Game Pass or on console or playing a free-to-play game. That's not the question. The subscription, or they paid buying their games, or they're playing a free-to-play game. I honestly, like, that's not the most important thing. I, so, you know, it's Pass, also not I the answer it. to I the question. The thing I really love about Game Pass, let me think, in our show today, a game like Mix... But it wasn't the question. The question was, how? what, what is Game Pass's place within your corporation. It wasn't, do you love Game Pass? It wasn't, do you, are you still a supporter of Game Pass? It wasn't, does Game Pass have some benefits to some creators? Yes, yes, and yes, we know these things. But again, that's not the question you were asked. Tape. Like a game like Misk Tape is a game that we can go, um, Nathan, Bell and I can have a conversation and say, with a team that's been in, in Game Pass before, yeah. when you, you think about the studio behind, they had great success. Now we're going to do a second game or like Winterboro, another like just awesome game that we can go invest in. And Game Pass gives us an ability. You can go invest in Call of Duties and Diablos all day. And we love that. But you also get to invest in new things that come out. And we just think that's a, a really important part of the equation. So we don't have like one. Subs now, Game Pass is up double digits. Like and in most of its growth, we, like we said it, PC is growing really well. Cloud's growing really well. But if somebody decides they want to buy their games and build their library, peace. Like there's there's no we need to turn everybody into this or that. We just want people to play. I want to talk not at all the answer to the question it, it didn't um an answer to the question could have been something like you know ryan at this day and age we see game pass as the main vehicle through which we want to promote our thing you know that is our main competitive advantage over other platforms and over other ecosystems you know we are able to bring people a low barrier of entry to a whole lot of games and a whole lot of devices with a whole lot of choice and the main vehicle that is making this happen is game pass so yes it has taken on an even more crucial or important or at least it has shifted you know naturally from being a service that was available as a choice to being a core driver of our value proposition towards our customer that would have been an answer that could have been given not necessarily the answer but again, it's like that would have answered the question. That would have addressed where is Game Pass sitting in the calculus of your of, of your you know corporation. What what you say about loving Game Pass and about how mixtape and you know Net Winterboro and all of these other games? Yes, it's great that um, the Game Pass money that you give to these indie developers is able to sponsor those games. Sure, flex that absolutely. You know, PlayStation Plus does the same thing. But again, it's like. Not the question you would ask me. About Fallout for a second. So you, you guys are 
currently having a, an awesome pop culture moment. Fallout TV year. show. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, my, yeah so I, good. So good. Uh, but I, ca I can't help think about that a year or two ago, I was sitting with Todd Howard with a camera rolling, and, and I asked him, well, you know, Fallout 5, is that, you want to do that yourself? Or maybe now there's all these Xbox studios, you could, you could maybe get, have some help with it. And said, no, I, I want to, that's going to, that's mine. I'm yeah, going to direct that. Yeah. But does, <laughs> Todd likes his things. And, but does the, does the massive success of something like Fallout, like Fallout, I would, I would argue is, the, is Xbox's biggest cultural moment in quite a while. Like it transcended. Outside of gaming. Yeah, yeah. 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 And so, you know, after the TV show blows up and there's, there'll be a season two and I'm sure it'll probably keep going past yeah. that. Do you, do you talk to Todd about like, you know, you can't, you can't stop the Elder Scrolls Six and say go do Fallout Five, but but you have all these studios. Like, do you have a conversation about like, well, how can we do a new like a big new Fallout while the the iron's really hot here with the TV show? Yeah, I'll just say that Todd's recognized the success of the television show on his own, right? He didn't need me to kind of go, and it's it is amazing to see how gaming is now playing such a role all up in pop culture. If you go back, like as an old comic nerd, I go back like 10 years and it seemed like every Hollywood thing came from the comics. And now you see video games and this art form that we've loved for so long, whether it's the Mario movie, Last of Us, Fallout Joe, like you see our creatives in our industry being recognized for the worlds and storytelling that they can go do. Um, for us specifically, Fallout's been amazing. And yeah, Todd's kind of looking at the plans on what he's doing. I'm not gonna get into it, but I'll say Todd has recognized the success on his own and is thinking through what that means. Uh, I guess while we're on the subject, have you seen The Elder Scrolls Six lately? Because I know you get to take a look at a lot of stuff. I, um, I'm gonna... Ryan, The Elder Scrolls Six doesn't exist. <laughs> I've seen it on a piece of paper, and that motherfucker's looking tragic. <laughs> Is the answer he probably should give, right? Like, let's be honest. I feel like a person like a, or a studio like Bethesda, they don't seem well equipped to handle multiple projects at once. Like, I don't think that they would have really done like started pre-production in a serious way on the Elder Scrolls, you know, six or whatever. I'm sure they have ideas down on paper, but. Is there like a playable build somewhere? I mean, I'll be surprised, but I'm sure like in a documentary four years from now, we'll find out exactly when and where pieces were falling into place and how serious development was along the way. But there was no answer we were ever gonna get from this. I'll refrain from comment. <laughs> <laughs> I think we all know what, what you mean by that. That's right, boomy, boomy. <laughs> boomy. Oh my goodness, well, ask Todd to, you know, Todd, I know you can't hurry. Speed it up, you know, Todd. We're, we're waiting here, pal. Um, there's one one other thing I wanted to ask you about that I thought we actually might hear something about from you. I mean, you had a great show. I'm not Thank complaining. You. But I thought, well, there's something that's been rumored, that's been talked about. We talked about it on the pre-show. There was a big reaction from our audience here, and that is an Xbox handheld. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So you are a, you're a guy. I mean, y you have the gamer score to prove it. Like, you <laughs> you walk the walk. You are not a guy that, that runs the business and never touches a game. You, you actually pretty much do nothing but play. Again, <laughs> you do nothing but play games. <laughs> this is one of my biggest points of contention with Phil Spencer. He plays too many games. You should be part of the business. I'm sorry. I've always said this. I don't want a leader to be the person that can like, during, the, during your tenure where you can like keep up with gamers because it's like, no, you need to be working for us. You need to be bringing us these games, you know? And uh, yes, uh, Phil Spencer is a gamer, but we should not evangelize it when him being a gamer hasn't resulted in gamers receiving more games. You know, like, let's evangelize if you manage to do both. If you can do both to near perfection, absolutely, you know? But for me, you know, um, Herman Holtz, I'm sure, is a gamer. But during his tenure as the CEO or, yeah, the CEO of, like, PlayStation Studios or the PlayStation Studios group, I think that's why he's the studio. Like, bro, if, if you are no longer playing, um, you know, games as much as you used to, good. That's good, you know? Um, I don't want a gamer. Um, I certainly don't want Herman Holtz to be playing as much games as I do. It's like, no, <laughs> definitely not. You, you better fall behind. You better fall behind. That backlog of yours better stretch to infinity. Bro, I need you to only be touching a controller when it is proof testing a game and making sure that this meets the PlayStation quality. Aside from that, bro, I want your PlayStation controller to traumatize you. 
Like, if you play games, you better play them on Xbox because you can't stand the sight of another dual sense in your hand because you just know that means work. You better, I, I said it's the same thing for Jim Ryan. I said, I want Jim Ryan to be traumatized by that PlayStation beep. That beeping sound that he does when you turn on the console, that little beep, that little thing there. I, I, I bet you Jim Ryan still doesn't allow his PlayStation to not be, you know, like that mute option. I bet you that was from him. He was like, listen, guys. If I'm going to keep my sanity, I need you to tell that motherfucking thing to start, just turn off that sound. Because even when my children turn on this thing, I have PTSD moments, okay? Because it's meant to signify work, you know? Like Pavlos dog, every time you hear that beep, you're like, oh no, I have to, I have to, I have to decide. Am I firing this team? Am I promoting them? Am I giving them another $50 million? Where am I going to get that $50 million from? Do I have to go go up to Sony again and ask for more money? Do I fire them? Do I get rid of this team? You need to be stressed out whenever you hear that beep. So listen, I'm not a fan of Phil Spencer being such a gamer because I think it stands in the way of his executive duties. That's my main issue video games and i mean that in a co as a compliment no you <laughs> don't it's sometimes. actually the truth yeah, yeah. But, but really seriously like the i love that i don't play video games. I play video games. it's kind of true the uh you know you've you've been building the business around this mantra of of go where the players are you know whether it's on pc whether it's through so we should have a handout i think so i think we you, you want to say anything about I don't, no i don't want to say i think you have to have sarah on sarah bond our president of xbox which is awesome um but like the future for us in hardware is pretty awesome and the work that the team is doing um, around different form factors different ways to play I'm incredibly excited about today was about the games yeah we showed some of our ex our gen 9 console series s series x the work that we're doing but we will have a time to come out and talk more about platform and we can't wait to bring it to you well, guys. all right I, I'm not gonna let you off the hook quite okay. one more I tried <laughs> so hypothetically 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 if, if Microsoft did an Xbox gaming handheld you know PC device would it be a Steam Deck like dedicated Hard piece of hardware that I can play offline, or would it be something I would need a Wi-Fi connection to stream things from? No, I think if you're, what I'm finding, I'll do it this way. So I like my ROG Ally, my ROG Ally is my Lenovo Legion Go, fantastic, my Steam Deck. I think being able to play games locally is really important. Okay, create a PlayStation Portal equivalent, but then give it some native capacity or capability. You know, um, I don't think you should do a dedicated line of games, you know, like, a PlayStation Portable or a PlayStation Vita where it has its own platform and it has to have games ported to it and those games are different behind the scenes to you know the kernel that you release on the main platform I think that there needs to be that seamlessness between your two you know your two hardwares so that they share one platform but you give the capacity that the portal doesn't have, which is to play games locally. We talked about it before. You don't have to have every single game that is released on the series consoles run on your handheld locally. But if you had even just a small selection, even like 200 titles, but like 200 are the best titles. For example, take like Hades, take Dave the Diver, take Dredge, take Cocoon, you know, take... um. Ori and the Will of the Wisps, you know, those games that are definitely like, you know, when you install them, they're like, I don't know, anywhere between like 300 megabytes to like up to 40 gigs or something. But they are games where behind the scenes, it, they're not running complexities where they will drain battery life. Um, you don't have to give it the power and the performance of something like an MSI Claw where you basically have an entire computer built in. Um, yeah, no, I think that there is a there is a world for there is a there is a market segment that will respond well to those types of devices. Take a portal, but make it capable of running certain games. And I think Sony should still do it because if Sony came out, let's say a year from now, and they said, "Okay, Emmanuel, you love your portal." but you've always wanted it to be able to run some kind of native games and so here is a playstation portal pro or a playstation i don't know what they will call it like a vortex you know <laughs> whatever it is whatever it is right um and then you can trade your playstation portal and then this playstation vortex thing will come out at like a 350 450 ish price point like let's say 400 dollars but it is it's the exact same thing that the portal was so that if you want to play god of war or horizon 
you are still connected to the cloud or oh, and also give it cloud capability you know because why now the portal can only connect directly to your own playstation let it connect to like playstation's cloud network um and then if you want to play smaller games and we will have a collection we will have iconography on the store so that you know where whether or not this can be run natively on the playstation vortex um then yeah we can do that for you and if you already own some of those games so if you already have access to them through playstation extra playstation plus whatever then it's just seamless is there's that seamless integration you know it, it it talks it communicates it shares you know save files and everything everything that you would expect like yes it is running locally on this device for certain games but there's a seamless connection between that and your other playstation you know main playstation console i think that would be great i do disagree with two ideas so the first idea that i disagree with is that somehow this should be a um its own ecosystem of games that have to be built from the ground up. So it needs its own exclusives and everything. I think that's a mistake. The PlayStation Vita route, I think that's a bad idea. The second bad idea, I think, is the MSI Claw idea, the Lenovo Legion Go, where it's a piece of hardware that is so powerful that it can actually run pretty much every PlayStation 5 or Xbox Series games uh, directly, natively on it. Yes, at 30 frames per second and a lower frame rate, but now you are dealing with, like, fan noise you're dealing with like um short battery life you're dealing with you know substandard performance because you're no longer getting 60 frames and things like that um i don't think it should be that either because i think trying to shrink basically the playstation 5 to be in a handheld form even a depowered version i i, I think mm -mm, i don't think that's the right way so if they're going to come up with an xbox handheld i hope they take either a playstation portal or they do what the PlayStation Portal should have been and do a slightly more versatile with some native game capability. Because again, you can also pull from the Xbox One library. Like maybe Horizon Forbidden West can't run on the PlayStation Portal Pro, but maybe it can it can run Horizon Zero Dawn, right? Maybe it's still at 30 frames per second, but at least it will be locally. So you know what? Those that would, those would be my wishes for the Xbox. Just take that, and I'll only talk about the PlayStation version because. I'm familiar with that device. I don't have um, like Little Legion Go. I don't have a um, MSI Claw. I don't have a Steam Deck. I don't have a what was the other one? I feel like the, the Asus ROG Ally X now, right? Um, yeah, so I don't have those devices. So I kind of I kind of base my point of understanding begins at the portal, and then I say how I would like it to be. But obviously, just the Xbox equivalent uh, for that. So I hope that's the that's the approach that they take. I think that would be best. You can, you can read between the lines on that, uh, as, as you will. Uh, all right, we're gonna take a very quick break, but we're not done with Phil. We're gonna bring in some friends, some Xbox developers. Okay, so that's it. Um, that's all we talk about there. So, whew, that's been, what, an hour or so, or so of discussion. And you know what, we're gonna keep going because I don't edit, okay? We're just gonna go to gameindustry.biz. This is going to be like a three hour video, damn. I'm so good to you guys, let me tell you. Look at me giving you all my time over here. Let's get straight into this. Hello and welcome to GI Sprint, our new editorial event series all about making video games cheaper, faster and better. Over the coming weeks you'll read, listen and watch sessions on things like AI, cloud, team synergy, hybrid working, distribu distributed development and a whole lot more. But to kick this series off, we've got a special guest who has been discussing this very issue, the sustainability of the games business for, for at least five years now. Um, he's currently a strategic advisor for a whole host of games companies, including Tencent, but is probably best known for his years as the president and CEO of PlayStation America and the chairman of PlayStation Studios. It's Sean Layden. Hi, Sean. How are you doing? Hey, Chris. Pretty good, brother. How are you? I'm, I'm, I'm delighted to have you here, uh, as I say. It's, I always love talking to you. Um, um, it's always absolutely fascinating. Because actually, I was looking back. And I was trying to see when we, when you, when, when the last time we hit the headlines, you were talking about um, games and sustainability, and before the first time we did anyway. And the one I came up with was in 2020, which is around the Last of Us Part Two thing, which is four years ago. And at the time, you were a bit concerned about, um, uh, particularly the move into the next generation and all, and all the and all the costs that might bring with it. Has um, and now we're four years, now we're almost four years into that generation, which is terrifying to me. But has it played out as you as you feared? Sadly, it does me. It does my heart no good to say um, I think I was right, yeah. but it looks like I was, and and it wasn't any great prediction. You're just watching trend lines over 25 years of gaming. Um, mm. You know the numbers only go in one direction. Games don't get cheaper, they don't get shorter. 
um, they get more complex, they, they become more costly. Again, as we talked before, Chris, you know, the only factor that comes into the cost of the game is labor over time. Yeah. And you know, you're not building any factories, you're not turning sand into glass or something. It's just people power and what it costs to get the people together to make the game. And how do you manage this, those inputs <coughs> into, that, uh, into that formula that try to keep it below $250 million if you can? So yeah, um, completely different mood, right? I feel like when IGN, well, pretty much what anyone that um, Microsoft PR uh, allows to interview Phil Spencer, so much of his um, charisma, so much of his personality um, is the thing, is the draw, is the main factor. So they evangelize him and, and they pop him up. I like this because, you know, it's just a completely different energy. First of all, I do think that it has a lot to do with cultural differences, you know, Europe versus America. Um, but I like the fact that we are straight away getting things that are like, this is a mathematical, cold-hearted calculation. This is what goes into the process. This is what costs have to do, you know? Like we talk about, you know, the previous segment with Phil Spencer, how I said that, hey, listen, when you pay for 70 billion, you are acquiring the opportunity to just pay more money. But Phil Spencer will never tell you that. I like the fact that Sean Layden just goes straight into it and he's like, yeah, basically the only thing we have to worry about is the number of people that we're going to bring onto your project multiplied by the amount of time that are going to stay for that project. And that's it. Like really at the basis of it, that is the main critical factor. Yes, of course, there's still buildings and insurances and everything like that, but everything can be boiled down to that there being like probably 80% of the pie in terms of costing, you know, of, of building a game. And it's just like immediately we see that there is substance and i like that yeah. and um but frankly you know the, the large blockbusters when people are swinging for the fences um they're coming in you know the 150 200 250 million dollar bracket and that is a huge burden on, on the game development business model on the publishers for carrying that uh and then i think we see some of the contraction in the marketplace in the game industry industry space that we've seen over the last six to eight months uh 2023 was just a horror show ask anybody in the business um, oh yeah by the way uh if you're hearing like well vibrations that's that's my phone apologies for that i'm getting some messages when the price of money went up the price the, the amount of money flushing through the systems went down um consolidation was happening left and right so much more industry energy seemed to go into buying a thing rather than building a thing and um now here we are in 2024 where quite frankly earlier in the year i don't know how to say this chris i was actually more bullish on gaming in january than perhaps i am today in may really oh i've yeah. gone the other way I was I was I was in despair. Well it's because I write the news, right? So I was in despair in January and every story was miserable. There was no there was no positives I could find anywhere. And then sort of when GDC started to kick off, there was still a lot of misery. But there was a, there was also a lot of new studios starting up, new funds forming. There was a lot there was some there were some stories amongst all that that was um that when that we I wasn't getting three months earlier. So I started becoming a little more optimistic. Also it helped that the first three months of the year also saw things like Power World and Helldivers break through and, and the market the market sales of the industry wasn't as bleak as some analysts had predicted, at least for the first quarter. So that sort of gave me feel a little bit more optimistic. And I want to stress well, How about the last seven days, Chris? Yeah, well, well, and that's, but then you're right. You know, it's the, there is all of this um, uh, uh, scenario where, you know, you've got, you know, what's going on at, you know, Take Two and now Microsoft and, and, and but that stuff, I, you know, I didn't, I did think, you know, particularly when I saw Microsoft's financials, I was, um, <clears throat> I was, um, you could see outside of Activision Blizzard, there was no, there's no growth there. Okay, I just wanted to say from a presentation standpoint, I hate webcams. I really, really do. Um, listen, Sean, my man, I think you're good and all, yeah? But can you get yourself like a Sony camera? Like surely you know people at Sony that will be willing to give you a webcam setup powered by like their lenses and their, their imaging technology. Like, come on. You're using like a laptop camera again, like boy, or like one of those Logitech ones. Come on, get yourself like a real Sony camera. Surely you have the contacts to be able to, to give you something nice. Okay, I don't care if you have some kind of like disagreement with the people at PlayStation. Like, still they owe you that much. Okay, you contributed enough that it can give you and it can send like a videographer to your house in order to give you good lighting, good camera, good backdrop because the backdrop that you have there is not is it's 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 no. It's just no. And, and and Chris, Chris, same thing for you. You know, I, I mean, I guess you're not connected to Sony, so they're not going to send people to your house to give you the thing. But can we get rid of this entire, like, what is this? What is this thing? What is this banner ad in the corner? Like, why is there no transparency filter on this? Like, 
Gameindustry.biz, you got bought out by IGN now, right? So it's like, can we get some of those editors and everything to give you something better than this super distracting thing that cuts into half of your face? Like, what is this doing? Presentation standpoint, I don't want to see your door, boy. Like, it's, it's awful. But hey, we're here for the substance, okay? Not the big studio environment thing. But I've got to say, we just watched <laughs> these interviews back to back. And as much as I don't like the fanfare and the building and the, the fake um, things around the IGN interview, I, I, I do like the presentation a lot better. This is just, this is so much, mm, it's, it's, below, it's below standard. They are, they are literally podcasts that are done by people in our community, you know, that have better presentation than this. And you guys need to like, you know, you guys need to bring up your level. Which is the, which is the big problem, isn't it? Because you, you were taught, you alluded it there, cost of money and stuff. But we also, we saw wages and everything go up during the pandemic when the industry was booming and everyone was competing for talent. And then the cost of living crisis caused the wages to go up again. So you almost saw, you have that on top of the, the, the cost of developing games, these new systems. And then you've got um, the fact that our post-pandemic, the growth hasn't been there either. That's quite a... Terror. I can understand now why you're, why you're feeling a little bit more bleak in May than you were, um, um, than you were a few months ago. Let's not say bleak. Let's just say bearish yeah. uh, rather, than, rather than bullish, a bit bearish right now. I yeah. think the industry is, is still trying to um, try to right, right the boat right now. And mm -hmm. it's uh, to your point, right, growth has slowed down, costs have gone up. That's always a bad one-two punch. And I'm afraid the other thing which is in decline is patience. Mm. That's the real frustrating thing when you see people... Um, Look, here's a small studio. It made a great game. It has true promise. It, it created an entirely new, you know, gaming experience. But we don't have the patience to play this thing out into part two or part three. Um, even mm -hmm. though we didn't really get wiped out by it, we didn't, uh, we didn't have the windfall profits that we thought we'd have. And so we just, we just kill these things and go for more established AAA IP uh, sequels, copycats, and things that, um, from a financial perspective, you can draw a through line and say, if we build this game, it's likely to perform like this in the market. When you bring in completely new things that people have not seen before, which may be fantastic and quite often are, um, the publishing industry doesn't have patience now. To yeah, so this is an interesting point, isn't it? Because uh, he talked this a little bit about this more in depth on uh, What's Up PlayStation with uh, Jay Barry and Persona. Absolutely go watch the Sean Layden interview over there because... Uh, it's, it's a better format and also better presentation. And I mean, this is what I mean. Like, what's a PlayStation puts a better presentation than game industry dubbies? There's an issue there. But in any case, he, um, speaking of substance, he talked a little bit about this. If you are a publisher and somebody comes and presents you an idea, if they can say to you, hey, listen, our idea is like, if you took GTA, but then you made it even more satirical and with even more wacky characters, and our idea is Saints Row. And at least for this, the first one, it's like, it's easier for them to understand what you're trying to say. And maybe it's easier for you to pitch that idea because they have a point of reference. And then they can say, hey, listen, okay. So we know that GTA 5 cost 200 million for work styles to make, okay? So if we put in, let's say, 90 million into your project just for the first time around because we're not exactly sure if we'll turn out we can see we can estimate that perhaps we will sell you know x amount of copies and therefore you know let's say this they say we'll sell 10 million copies and we'll sell them at 50 dollars a pop that will give us 500 million dollars back okay go ahead do the project but what he's talking about is now okay imagine if someone said we have a brand new idea never be done before something like a death stranding right where it really doesn't have any comparable thing that you can point to and be like oh our game is like this game and what he's saying there is that publishers no longer have this tolerance this patience that okay cool we release the first death stranding sure fine it does okay it does whatever it's not in the red but it's not as green as we hoped that it had been and what he's saying is that very few of them nowadays are going to give you a second chance instead are going to say yeah listen this whole Death Stranding thing, what if we made it a little bit more like Call of Duty or we made it a little bit more like Battlefield or we made it so that they, you know, they had a live service component? Now they're changing what your original pitch was because despite how the fact that something like Death Stranding found its audience, they may have wanted to sell instead of 10 million copies, 30 million copies. And so not specifically talking about Death Stranding and PlayStation necessarily, but just talking about the industry at large, you know, there are so many more publishers than just the platform holders, Xbox, Nintendo, and Sony. No, there are people who are like, you know, take two, 
they are technically a publisher despite the fact that they mostly focus on like GTA and Red Dead Redemption, right? Um, publishers like Ubisoft, you know, they've got the Ubisoft Originals program, um, but they are also like a full-on publisher in and of themselves. People like EA, you know, um, people like Embracer, they're a publisher as well. So it, the point is this, there are there is less and less willingness from the people that have the money that can gatekeep the, the industry to be able to put a bet on a game like Parappa the Rapper, you know, or a, a game even like SingStar, you know, like what he's basically saying there is that back in the day, people were trying more and they were throwing things at the wall to see what stuck, but they were also more willing to even use the success of the big items to give, you know, some kind of, um, some kind of one way for the ideas that may have been wilder or may have been harder to pin down. How is this exactly going to work? Because it doesn't have any comparables. Yeah. To, to nurture these things, and they, they feel they need the quick big win, and that's, and that's a terrible place to be in an entertainment and creative industry. That is that is actually a, I, I, I did a, it, it, by the time this has come out, it will be quite an old article now. But I've just published a, a, a piece where I talked about how it's related to the recent layoffs at Microsoft, where I was, um, uh, my concern was. At the beginning, it was all about expanding the audience and finding new players and doing new things uh, with new business models and new games. And my fear was that because of the situation, it's now about the big brands and the big blockbusters and focusing more on those, which you, know, you get. But you'd, I hoped, I hoped, I wrote in the piece, I said, I hope that they've not given up on that dream either because that's our future. And yeah, I think Microsoft has. I think Microsoft has given up on, you know, for example, take a look at Hi-Fi Rush. Hi-Fi Rush is, an, is a perfect example of what Sean Little was talking about. Like, yeah, Hi-Fi Rush, the first one, maybe it didn't set the world on fire, but I don't think that Hi-Fi Rush lost money, especially after the port to PlayStation. I think that it probably just made enough to pay for its own budget, like it paid for itself. And Hi-Fi Rush 2 could have been an opportunity, um, or maybe not even a Hi-Fi Rush 2, maybe just another new IP you know, boosted, you know, kind of like you, you have, you have these creatives that are people at the end of the day. And if they see that, Hey, you stuck by us, even when we didn't make a game that set the world on fire, um, then they could take that encouragement, that positive validation and really put their heart and soul into another game. That could be an, again, another new IP could again be wacky, could again be completely out of left field, but this time it is the hit factor. And basically, instead of that, what Microsoft decided was like, no, like we have Call of Duty, we have Gears, we have Elder Scrolls, we have Fallout, we have, um, you know, State of Decay, we have all of these big guaranteed bets. And they are seduced by that because of course you are, because nobody likes losing money. Certainly not corporations and certainly not hundreds of millions of dollars at a time. Hitting the blockbusters is not innovation, mm -hmm. right? That's, um, that's taking care of your bottom line. And that doesn't grow the market because despite the fact that we can tell statistics that 75% of human beings are gamers, that includes everything from Words with Friends to Minesweeper to anything else you play on a, on a mm. tablet or a screen. But the, but the console game business is still, we've talked about this before, 250 million units plus minus. Yeah. And uh, the, all the growth we saw during the pandemic, or the majority of the growth we saw during the pandemic, was just getting more money from the same people. Yeah. Gamers were stepping up and putting more into their gaming obsession and that made the business go up. We weren't really seeing an influx of new gamers. I say, say, no, certainly not the console space. No, I thought it's interesting because I, I did wonder if that's that is something we saw. Um, because I I, um, I I just remember there was a very brief moment very early on in the pandemic in the UK anyway when the top ten gaming items or maybe it's the top twenty I can't remember now the Wii remote <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, reappeared. And obviously they're not new gamers because they have I assume they have Nintendo Wii's. But it, it said to me that this is an audience of people. There are an audience of people that haven't played a game in ten years mm -hmm. who are now dusting off their consoles for uh, in the cupboards. And I guess. I, 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 that was my single anecdotal point of uh, proof that we were finding new customers. But um, but they're not new because they had a Wii in the cabinet. Yeah, yeah. They're well, they're, they're lapsed, returning, maybe. They're lapsed gamers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? Yeah. And at the beginning of the pandemic, everyone tried anything to take their mind off of the horror that was erupting yeah. around them. And I think the blue went off that rose pretty fast for that, that category. So if we're not bringing new people in um, with our offering uh, of the console and the game, how do we think we're going to get new people by just making the same game? Mm. I mean, there's a vast majority of the planet which have already said, Grand Theft Auto, not that interesting. Call of Duty, not that interesting. They're both huge hits in our in our little village of, of gamers. Yeah. They're the biggest things in the world. I mean, Call, 
Grand Theft Auto V, I think every gamer has bought two copies of it. That's the only way the, uh, the sales numbers make any sense. Uh, but but you're not. If people have already said they're not interested in that experience, building more of those experiences will not get them in. Yeah. So this is an interesting point, isn't it? Because for me, I'm just going to give you my answer. My answer is movies, TV shows, and other trans media. A lot of people are still stuck on the fact that beyond just the financial consideration, yes, it costs money to get into the hobby, but you know what? It costs money to get into skiing. It costs money to get into cycling. It costs money to get into ballet, you know, like all of those things, they don't have to be like the biggest hobbies around, right? Like not everybody on earth is a ballet dancer. But the point is hobbies and having upfront costs, that is a perfectly normal thing. That's the thing that hobbies do. No problem. Hobbies even having fairly high upfront costs, again, that's perfectly normal. Some people get into shooting, like gun ranges and everything. That has that can have a steep upfront cost, right? Um, again, no problem. Um, I got into table tennis. I absolutely love table tennis. And guess what? That has an upfront cost. You know, if you want to get your own racket, your own bat, your own set of balls, and you know, if you go a little bit deeper, you know, want to get your own table, your own table ten, ten uh, you know kind of like club memberships and things like that. Yeah, those are upfront costs, that's fine. So the upfront cost of gaming, especially with consoles, because they are relatively like great value that you get out of them, especially when you realize that most people keep their consoles for 10 years or more. So again, that is actually a, comparatively speaking, small barrier of entry. That's not the thing that's preventing people from gaming. For me personally, the thing that's preventing people from gaming is that they do not realize that there are game experiences that are made for them. That's it. When I talk to people about gaming, you know, whether they be females or men, you know, people that just don't really value gaming at all in their lives, it's just they don't see what the big deal is. They literally don't know what they don't know. So I think that the, we need to educate uh, other people as to the benefits of gaming, but we can't do it through games because they've already rejected the medium. You know, it's a bit like um, a lot of people don't like to read books, especially kids, right? Kids, um, when they get somewhere between the, like at the beginning, they usually like it because bedtime stories and everything, they're like, yeah, I like books, read me books, mom, dad, whatever. Okay, they like books. Okay. But then somewhere between the ages of like 8 and 12, suddenly they don't want to read anymore. That's boring. I want the movie. I want the gaming. I want the iPad. I want the this and the that. And usually when they pick books back up, at least it was for my little brother, when they pick books back up, it's like 14, 15, 16, when you can show them like, hey, this movie that you loved, that's based on a book. Why don't you take the book and then go and see the more detailed version of that story that you love so much? And then when they're like, Oh, oh, that's great. That's, that was fantastic. Like it was so much more detailed than what they just put in the movies. And I'm like, oh yeah, you know, or for some people it's, um, it's manga, it's manga versus anime. You know, they'll watch something like a Naruto on, on TV and then they'll be like, oh, there's a manga out. And then they'll go and they'll read the manga. They'll be like, what? <laughs> you know, and then they do the whole comparison between manga and anime. And then they go to themselves, wait. I'm waiting for this season of like Demon Slayer or whatever to release. Why don't I just go read the manga that's already available and then that's it. So what I'm trying to say is that people need a bridge. You can't stay on your island of gaming and say like, through games alone, I'm going to bring people to me. You've got to reach out. You've got to build bridges for people to see the connection. So when a person sees something like The Last of Us TV show, I truly believe that you can convince, let's say even... 5% of the audience that watches The Last of Us TV show, hell, even 2% of the audience that watches the TV show, to be like, wait, this is based on a game. And also, I want to know what happens in the next season, but wait, the game is already out. Like, that story is already available to me. I can go tomorrow and buy season 2 of the TV show through the game. So, I think we need those connections. And I think that that's why the PlayStation Studios initiative of bringing gaming and TV and movies and, you know, those other, you know, even things like the Lego game, right? I think those are important. You've got to build bridges to your island because so far we've been on this island and we have been, you know, it's a bit like um, we've punched above our weight. That's, that's what we have, especially console type games, you know, because I know that gaming, you know, people are like, oh, that 3 billion gamers, but like Sean Layden said, like, 
if you play solitaire once on a 1998 you know computer you know you're technically a gamer or if you, you do the match three things on your mobile phone you're technically a gamer no really us on our island there's maybe 400 million of us and you know that are gamers and probably about 250 million of us at the time are on the island of gaming be like yeah if we punch above our weight we can take gaming to be far more valuable than any other piece or any other medium of entertainment and everything because we are so passionate and we are so driven we are so engaged and that's great right but we need to expand our island and our island needs to have different amenities for different people because there are going to be some people that even after they buy into being a gamer right they are not going to be a gta gamer they're not going to play gran turismo they're not going to play god of war they're not going to play death stranding you know they might play dave the diver they might play parappa the rapper they might play singstar they might play just dance they might play mario kart you know but we've got to have ways to accommodate for a wide variety of tastes and for me the way that i see platform holders specifically doing this is by partnering with studios that are outside of their purview because PlayStation has a PlayStation fragrance, right? Shout out to Jay Barry. Um, but it also means that just through the nature of who they are, they are more naturally and organically, at the moment anyway, they're more naturally and organically um, suited for certain types of experiences, you know, single player and narrative driven. But yeah, maybe the gameplay is a 2D side scroller. But as a PlayStation game, I expect you to have a great story. I really, really do. You know, um, I don't expect a power world from a PlayStation Studios. You, you do you get what I mean? Like, yes, I know that power world is popular and it is tremendously successful for what it is. No problem there. But I don't see a natural partnership, you know, between power world, you know, and PlayStation. Or I don't see a place like the next Sucker Punch game to be something in the realm of a power world, you know? Like Helldivers 2 broke people's minds because they were like, oh my God, Sony did this? And it's like, yeah, that's one moment where they've deviated from what they are usually typically expected from or Returnal. And those moments are great. But I don't expect PlayStation to somehow get all of the studios to do this or most of the studios to do this or have to acquire you know people are always telling playstation oh you need to acquire this person you know can a bridge of spirits acquire that studio uh dave the diver they'll say acquire that studio hades acquired that studio um you know they they will see any sort of like mildly successful indie game and i like acquire 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 and i don't think they should i think we need to let people have independent success because if a studio is like super giant games right takes on the hades and then makes a whole bunch of money they can then take that money and they can choose to move in more dynamic ways than they ever could on the playstation even if they made more money on the playstation playstation as a corporation will have a lower risk tolerance potentially than independent studios will so i think it's important that we keep that studio diversity yes some teams bring them into the playstation fold bring them under the xbox umbrella bring them on the nintendo bring them on the embracer bring them on the tencent when it makes the most sense but generally speaking i think we are all better off you know because the thing is also if you work for a company like sony or playstation as a creator as a creative you are taking still a lot of the risk, right? Yeah, some of it is mitigated, but you're still taking a lot of the creative risk. And because you work under a corporation, your profit is kind of capped and limited. You know, whereas if you have a truly independent studio, like let's say it's even a studio that could self-publish, something like a Larian with Baldur's Gate, right? Like if you hit the jackpot, quote unquote, if you really like make an impact, that can set you up and your kids and your family for life <laughs> like that one moment like that's basically what happened to minecraft isn't it so it's like yeah we need to not encourage all of this industry to just buy up everyone so that we can have people make a genuine amount of success on the games that they have and so that we can have moments where um 
the the whole um, industry can thrive even as small creators because if they hit it big uh, they get to take that money they get to keep it for themselves you know take a look at the hypercharge on box I think uh, studio they sold 50,000 copies on Xbox um, and that's fantastic for them because for them that could be like the next three years of their lives where they don't have to worry about bills at home and I'm not sure that happens if you're owned by Microsoft. I think if you're owned by Microsoft, you get a pat on the back, you get your paycheck for the year, and you're like, yep, okay, start the grind again. People need to have ways of making money, and if we are all owned by a corporation, there is a cap. That's the exchange. Yes, you get a bit more safety, but you also don't get the full totality of your profits. It yeah, seems pretty well, axiomatic to me. And when you look at sort of the movie industry, you look at what's, you know, what works in certain territories. They have their own movie industries, right, with their own, you know, or your Bollywood or Nollywood, whatever, whatever, whatever's the, the terms that people use to describe these sort of uh, movie industries in other, in other territories. Because mm-hmm. they, they acknowledge that those countries and those markets and those people might actually want something that isn't that's different to the rest of the world. And, I, and it's an interesting thing, I hear execs all the time talk about that, but I don't actually see that manifest itself outside of the indie space anyway. In, um, yeah, that is an interesting point that Chris, bring, uh, Chris Drink sorry, brings over here. Because it's like, yeah, um, you have Nigerian Hollywood, Nollywood, um, the Indian Hollywood, Bollywood, and that is because those territories, you know, whether that's Africa, whether that's India, you know, whatever part of the world you want to kind of assign that to, they are attracted to different stories. They are attracted to experiencing. It doesn't mean that they don't like the typical Hollywood movie. Of course they do, right? They Everybody enjoyed Avengers. Everyone enjoys like great blockbusters, Inception and things like that, that come from America but they also have the local culture that is providing the type of content that they specifically may want that an American would not be interested in. So I think it's, it's so interesting that he points out that we don't really have that in the gaming space, you know? Like we just had Tales of Kenzaro Zao, which was, you know, by a black studio and everything. I'm not sure where they are located. I think perhaps London or Europe or something, but how many of them do we see come from Africa itself? You know, like our industry is also on the creator side. Uh, one of the reasons we don't see so much diversity on the gaming side is because the creators are kind of nestled in hotspot areas. You know, you'll have like oh, studios in Holland or studios in France, studios in England. Okay, cool. Studios in the United States. Okay, cool. Studios in, that, in Japan, studios in South Korea, studios in China. But then when you look at, I, I bet you that, 95% of the studios that we look at um that we look at in the console gaming space as as things that matter i bet you 95% of those studios are outside of places you know like africa are outside of places like india are outside of places like australia you know like there are not many game creators telling local tales and selling to the local audience which is so interesting because in china that definitely happens right in china there are mmos in china that have tens if not hundreds of millions of players whether they are on mobile or on the pcs but they basically just market and operate within china itself they never need to go out of the the chinese boundaries and they are tremendously successful within that local territory how fascinating would it be if that kind of reality was spread all over the world where there are studios in Kenya that basically market to Kenyans and neighboring countries and those stories resonate really powerfully and they are making hundreds of millions of dollars but with pretty much the majority of the player base being local to where they come from. Uh, yeah, that's another thing. So my idea of um, of creating links using transmedia, you know, reaching out to customers and everything through movies and books and toys and whatever uh that didn't account for hey we also need creators that come from not just you know uh santa monica you know things like that in in games that are actually trying to talk to those sectors um, um i've sort of already read it, i've already gone off topic in, in, the, in the opening <laughs> the opening bit no, it's, um, it's, all, it's all the same thing right it's it's how does an entertainment industry continue to grow and expand and reach new people and to my mind that's through innovation to bring out new kinds of games Okay, yeah. you don't like first-person shooters and you don't like RPGs. Here's something else. Here's a rhythm action gaming piece that's all about music and bright colors and having a good time. You know, where's the space for those games? And how do we, how do we continue to, to provide outreach to get new people involved in the you know interactive entertainment uh, world? Hmm. Well, 
obviously the other one way to solve it's a short term solution to this is to try and get your costs down um, oh. while while you're trying to seek out that that, that, that growth I guess um, are you getting a sense of the- that transition was not the smoothest segue <laughs> that was not the smoothest segue wherever it felt like it was like yeah we've gone off topic let's get back on topic I'm just going to try and do a very clunky transition <laughs> sorry games industry is trying to do that or you're, you're seeing that at least in your travels around speaking to studios sure everybody has cost control in their mind and you're sort of born with that um but it's getting harder to do i think the rising in wages is a good thing mm-hmm. um i think uh people need to be paid a fair, paid a fair wage for their work and if you're working on projects which stand to make tens of millions or hundreds of millions of dollars i think you're the reward you receive from that activity should be you know, commensurate with your contribution. So rising wages is not a problem. I do think that we have to re-examine what the scope of games are and how big is big or how big is enough. Hmm. Um, if you still live in a world where you can look at different surveys and stuff where the average game, only 32% of gamers actually finish the game. So we're making a lot of game that no one's seeing or 68% hmm. of the people aren't seeing it. Um, let's look at that question and should we can... Now this is a fascinating point and I think this is why I enjoy um, listening to Sean Layden. Uh, fascinating point right because I think it's so true and in my own personal experience because you know you guys can obviously go and watch um, their videos yourself and I'll make sure that I link them in the description so that that can be a little bit easier for you um, but you think about what 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 they're saying here and but it's such a first fascinating and fantastic interview already much better than the, the previous one we just did but you take a look at the fact that 32% on average of people complete games. Now, if you take a look at The Last of Us Part II, one of the most completed games, right? It's like 50 something percent. Let's just say it's 50% just to make it easy. Okay, so that means that half of the people are still not reaching the completion, are still not finishing the game. And let's face it, The Last of Us Part II is about a 30 hour game, and that is about six hours too many. Like, there's, there's, there's a clear six hours of content that doesn't need to be there. And I'll tell you specifically where. Uh, without major, major spoilers, at the beginning of the game, you get to Seattle and it's like an open world kind of area, a little bit like Uncharted, just in a Last of Us way. But you pretty much have like an open suburb of the city to yourself. And that part adds so little to the game. Um, I like the fact that there are conversations between the characters that you are with and everything like that. But it just narratively... It didn't need to be as big as it was. I feel like you could have hit those points. First of all, you could have done it in a linear way without the openness. But second of all, you could have reduced that size by about 50% and it would have been just as impactful. So you could have actually, I don't want to cut it out because I know what they were trying to do. But I feel like that was them kind of acquiescing to, I guess, gamers' expectations of like, what this game was going to bring. It almost felt like, okay, we're not going to give them a multiplayer, so we're going to give them a really stout single-player experience. And I feel like it was too stout. I feel like it was too big. And I think that that area would have been a place where I would have reduced the amount of content and time that the players could have spent there because it really padded out the time and it wasn't giving you interesting gameplay mechanics. It's not like you were engaging... um, with the horde or or I mean we don't have really have hordes in like the last of us but suddenly you were engaging with the infected in like a days gone way where you were running up and down and you needed this space no you will enter into a building and it will be kind of like its own contained story right a little bit of um a little bit of exposition a little bit of law giving a little bit of dialogue between the characters and if there was an enemy encounter it will be pretty much restricted to that particular area Again, mechanically speaking, you didn't make use of this big open space that you gave the players. You could have cut it. You could have done it in a different way. Um, so, yeah, I would say get rid of that. And then the second part is um, after you leave the farm towards the end of the game, there are a bunch of encounters that happen where by then we are fully immersed into the story of the game, but then you throw encounters with like infected just on the way to our destination and they do nothing. I felt like they added an extra hour of my one time for nothing. Like I don't want to avoid another set of clickers or have to take them out or shoot them or do this because at this point, all I want is to just get to the end. Now, when you get to the final destination, they actually have an interesting system where you can set humans versus clickers Okay, and you can play with those gameplay mechanics, and that is different from everything, pretty much every other encounter design that you had in the game uh, beforehand. So that one is valuable, but 
on the way there on chemin there, there's nothing there's nothing there that was good and then th that that little moment of like ah oh, why do you have these enemies here i don't let me just get through this building the entire point for me to get through this building yes i could sneak around but that's just like 40 minutes yes i could shoot them but it's like why is this happening and sometimes i feel like games like that they are so narratively driven that they feel like throwing more encounters at you to justify it like hey we're a game we're a game we're a game still look you have to play look you have to engage in this combat encounter even though it's actually just ruining the pacing of the story because why are there in infectors in this particular building as well we just did it in that last building and we'll do it in the next building again can i just walk can i just walk through can i just walk through the building please can we just walk through but then if you just did a walkthrough, some gamers will claim walking simulator or you don't fight enough. So I feel like developers overcompensate. So that's a great point. And I will expand on that as well. Continue to build games that are unlikely for most of the people to even see the end of it. Because hmm. it costs to build to the end. And yeah. um, you know you can tighten that up. And if you can make your games on a shorter timeline, that'll reduce your cost because it's just labor against time. Um, it'll get you to market faster. You can please your customers sooner than always telling them to wait 45 years for your next opus. Um, mm. Yeah, I think we just have to re-examine how we present ourselves and our games to the, to the, to the, to the gaming public. And if people are going to say, well, it's not 120 hours, I don't want to buy that. Well, then you have to re-refactor re your expectations of, of, of what, what a game should be. Should it really, does it really have to be 120 hours? Yeah. Wow. Yeah, so again, salient point. Another example I'm going to take is Horizon Forbidden West. I love Horizon Forbidden West, okay? I really, really do. I put over 220 hours into it. Um, I think it's a fantastic game. Everything about it is, is it just, I, I love, I love that one. I love Aloy, I love those characters. But Horizon Forbidden West has 17 main quests, okay? 28 side quests, and then 20 errands. And the thing is, the errands are really just side quests again. Yes, some of them are simpler than like a typical side quest, but they're just side quests. So that's 48 side quests. And one thing that I learned when I was doing editing photography, when I was first, um, when I was first learning how to edit photography was how much is too much. Okay. So for example, with saturation, right? Increasing the intensity of colors, how, like, how do you find a good middle point where you are enhancing what is naturally present within your frame, but you are not overblowing it to like unrealistic proportion. And one of the, the teachers that I had simply said, go a third of too much. So what that means is if, for example, you have a photo, you have a scene, whatever, and you adjust it so that the saturation, you're trying to play with the saturation slider, so in the intensity of colors, go all the way until you go, that's too much. Like just push, don't even look at the number, just push the slider to the right until you look at it visually and you're like, that is too much. This moment you say that's too much, you stop. Then you look at the number and then you do a third of that number. So for example, let's say you push it all the way to 90 and at 90, your brain just goes, nope, I reject this, this is too much. So you stop there. Now the right amount will be about a third of that. So now you put it at 30. And what you find is that it gives it just a little bit of, 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 of zest, right? In order to make it worthwhile to have made that change in the first place, okay? But it doesn't push it so far where other people are gonna be like, mm, you made that fake, you edited it, it's over Photoshopped, it's this, it's that, it's this. No one will complain at about a third, okay, of too much. That has been one of the most poignant and the most important lessons I ever learned in um, editing photos. And I think that's what I will say to the gaming industry. Go to, uh, what is it? Go to Horizon for, for Forbidden West, right? It has 48 side quests and it has 17 main quests. So in total, in terms of quests, right? Um, so 48, 58, about 65. Do about a third of that, <laughs> okay? Just about a third, okay? Now don't give it to the main quests, okay? So let's say we keep the 17 main quests there. And let's say we're just gonna change the amount of side quests. So there's 48 side quests, okay? So let's keep the same, let's separate it. Let's do the 17 main quests. They get to stay, they get to be what they are. But the side quests, 48, that's too much. Okay, I'm sorry. And the reason that it's too much isn't because they are not worthwhile or they are kind of like errands or whatever. No, 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 like it's okay. But the reason it's too much is most people aren't going to see it. Now, divide that by three, 
and you get about 16 okay very simple number okay now you can push a little bit to either side of that okay so what if we push all the way to about 22 side quests okay and by side quests i mean 22 side quests and errands i, I put them down all side quests to me okay so then maybe you will say okay so then we'll split it into 12 side quests and 10 errands okay so 12 side quests where they're a little bit more involved you know and the thing is what happens there is that the writing can improve because now instead of asking your writers to write little little storylines throw away things for all of these 48 pieces of content now they only have to do let's say 20 to 22 pieces of content they can really dive deep and make meaningful things come out of it you know so for example one of the side quests that you have or one of the you know um one of the it, it's kind of like a multifaceted um progression you know kind of based thing is when you first arrive in um when you first around in Horizon Forbidden West, when you first around at the antennas, uh, this is the, the the clan side of like the Uluru. You find that they have a lot of these red vines that are very toxic and everything. Now, over the course of the game, you deal with that problem, and you see that now the um the land is full of greenery the land is full of like farming and you've healed the land again right and this is part of the main quest you know like it's really tied to the main quest but what if you could do that also for side quests what if you could like drain certain lakes or you could flood certain areas or you know and then um the 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 ecosystem of the region is going to change maybe you see more you know bigger animals more balls towards lakes and rivers that have been decontaminated uh, decontaminated maybe you see npcs that are walking up to like the river to like bring water back you know and everything like that or maybe you see a world that is full and there's a line now where there didn't used to be one because now this thing is active and the people can use it you can make all of those things feel more meaningful if you're not trying to handle so many things and again for the gamer he only has to engage in 12 things rather than you know like 12 major side quests that are going to have like environmental changes you could you could split it that way like our 12 official side quests they have an impact on the world and the, the player can see that and there's a difference in the geometry that they can see and experience cool and then the 10 errands those are more like you know fetch quests you know they they, they are nice little contained stories but there's no kind of like impact after it's done you know you get your bow or you get your piece of armor and so you go right and i think that would be better because you will improve the quality and you reduce the quantity and i just want to say one last thing this isn't just tied to like AAA games or open world games. Think, take a look at Sea of Stars. Sea of Stars is an indie game. I absolutely loved the game when I was playing it, but it was a little too long. Like an indie game like that, having 20 plus hours. Mm -mm. And then it had 60 conches, 60 collectibles, basically. Um, if again, a, a third of too much would have said they have 20. And believe me, 20 would have been the right amount of collectibles for that game. It would have been like, yep, as I'm naturally playing, I can easily pick up 12 or 13 of them. And then when I'm doing the cleanup, I just have to go to a few key areas and boom, I've got the trophy. I've got the maximum amount of in-game, you know, thing that they tie to it. A third of too much is my contribution to the gaming discourse, okay? I think people should aim for that. And I think we need to do, we do need to make these games shorter. Absolutely. Uh, I, I spent pretty much nine months trying to finish the new Zelda game. <laughs> I didn't want to spend nine months, to be honest with you, um, uh, on a game that size. But I, I'm, I'm a... Same thing with um, yeah, Zelda. Zelda has 120 shrines. A third of too much says 40 shrines. 40 shrines would have made Breath of the Wild, I'm talking Breath of the Wild specifically, would have made Breath of the Wild way better. Like all of these shrines, after a while, you just get exhausted of seeing yet another shrine you need to go to. I did about 90 shrines and I was like, boy, I would have been so happy at 60. I was like, if you had 60 shrines, I would have been so happy. And a third of too much would have made it 40, which means it never would have bothered me in the first place. I never would have realized that I'm coming up to the end. And then by the time I realized, oh, I've done all the shrines, I'm like, wow. That was so cool. That was so fun. And you would have kept all of the ones that were the most unique. I still remember, like, there's, like, three shrines in Zelda that I remember vividly. There was one where there was, like, a maze, right? <clears throat> 
there's a there's a maze and the ball drops from the sky and what you're supposed to do is you're supposed to use the gyro controls if you so choose or you could use some other controls if you wanted you're supposed to use the gyro controls to get the ball to land on the platform and then go down the maze path and then find it and then eventually you get your solution but then I realized that it was gyro control and I was using like I said I don't use the switch um, portable so I was using the um, the pro controller that also has a gyro control built in and i realized wait if i turned it to the side i could see that the underside of the shrine maze thing that was the thing you were controlling i could see that the underside was flat so i just turned the controller upside down and then <laughs> when the ball fell it just landed on a straight path without any maze and i just flicked it over to the other side and it was boom it was me using lateral thinking in order to solve that shrine so i always remember it but that was one out of 90. And like I said, there's about three or four or five where I was like super creative and it pushed me and I thought out outside the box and I was like, huh, I wonder if this can happen. And it happened and it's great. But five out of 120 isn't a good ratio. If it was five out of 40, I'll be like, wait a second, for one eighth of the slides, or let's say I even managed to do this with 10, right? That means that 25% of, of the entire shrines, I would have been able to be like, yeah, I solved it in my own way. No guides, no nothing, no following what the, what the developers expected me to do. I found my own path and that was fantastic. And then the other 30, I solved it the way it should have been solved. Okay, cool, no problem. Better because it's shorter. I'm not entirely sure I'm a typical gamer. Um, so, you, is it only, is it, so is it length, is that the thing? Is it, is it, game, is it sort of controlling the size of your game or is there more to it? it? It's a combination of things. I mean, length is just one measure I, I talk about just because it was such a big deal in the early days of gaming, right? In the PlayStation 1, 2, 3 generations. That was like your top, your top review point was, oh, such and such game came out. It's got 90 hours of gameplay. It's amazing. You know, we kept judging games by you know, how much gameplay you get for your dollar. Um, and maybe that yeah, was a metric back in the time when the average gamer was late teens, early 20s, which means you're uh, time rich and money poor. Hmm. So having to, having to sit down for that long of a sesh to get through, you know, some huge, huge RPG didn't seem like, um, uh, seem like a reasonable thing to do when you're 19 years old. Um, I just think now the average age of gamers is approaching early thirties. You got the flip, right? You're more money rich and more time poor. Yeah. And, um, you have to really kind of strap, strap, you know, strap on some free time if you're going to sit down with Red Dead Redemption 2 and open that up and try to get through that whole thing. Yeah, you know, and this is this is so true. We've now flipped the, for most of us anyway, you know, I'm 31 at the moment. Um, but a lot of my peers, they have children. Like, <laughs> my peers that I used to play bad, Battlefield, Bad Company 2. And we, we, we would, you know, back when I was like 16, 17, we would go on for hours late into the night at two o'clock in the morning and we're still gaming and we have school the next day but we are, we've been on it since 8 p.m that's usually when we will start so that means that's six hours of gaming pretty much day in day out like it was you know like that was our thing and so getting all of that value out of a single title like we didn't play anything else basically like my, one of my friends and I, we would try other games during the day and then we would meet back up on Bad Company uh, at night. But my other friends, they were like, yeah, that's it. Like, I, I come on, I turn on Bad Company. That's what they played. And so, yeah, money, uh, money poor, time rich. But now I can buy pretty much any game that I want, right? Without having to really think about like the financials of it. So without having to think about the financials of that purchase the way I used to back then. But now I'm thinking Baldur's Gate is a game I have, you know, I have. But I'm thinking to myself, do I have 120 hours to dedicate to one game? And that is for a fairly standard playthrough. And whenever I get into a game, guys, man, I want to dive into it. Like if there is a piece of content, I want to experience it. I, I could easily spend 200 hours in Baldur's Gate 3 without finishing it. Do I want to do that? Where what does it, where do I find this time? What does it take away from relationships, family, friends, hobbies, other things, gym? You know, like it's just <laughs> you have the money now, but you don't have the time to enjoy gaming the same way that you did. So it's like if this is now most of us, then why are these games still trying to market themselves as to how much time they can bring us? Because yeah, game length now. It's a bad measure. And unfortunately, it's a toxic measure because now you have people saying something like, oh, Ratchet & Clank is only an 8-hour game or a 10-hour game or a 12-hour game um, or a 20-hour game to Platinum. 
and that is not worth $70 or it's not worth $60 because XYZ or the game is, you know, used to offer a hundred plus hours for the same amount of money. And it's like, oh, no, we, we can't be having surface level conversations in this way anymore. So um, we need to understand where our customers are. What are they looking for? Do they want a high impact, high, uh, uh, high enjoyment um, piece of gaming, which may not include large sections of the game where you're going on a quest to find this blue rock to bring it to the red troll and he'll open the door for you mm. which is kind of like burning time cycle it's, it's called grinding for a reason mm -hmm. and um, maybe that's not the enjoyable gameplay mechanic that that never used to put up with or, or used to used to enjoy 25 years ago and maybe we want tighter gameplay with with more action more impact more exciting things going on over a maybe mm. short time it's the same thing with um the foxes in ghost of tsushima right um the foxes and Ghost of Tsushima. I got um I got tired of it. Like every time that a yellow bird will come, she'd be like, "Hey, there's something over there," and I'd be like, "Oh, does it have to be?" I was kind of going somewhere, but I'm like, "Okay, fine, I'll follow you because I don't know the next time I'm gonna be going through this area, and I know that there's going to be some trophy, even though I usually don't take a look at trophy lists before I start a game. I know there's going to be some trophy tied to these collectibles, even if it doesn't say find all of them." Uh, typically, they always say find all of them. Uh, but anyways, I'm like, yeah, well, I guess I may as well. But am I really thrilled to be interrupted by this yellow bird for the dozen times? Dozen f time for, tr <laughs> for the twelfth time? No, I'm, I'm not really thrilled about it anymore. Maybe if it happens six times, I'll probably be like, hey, I, I stumbled upon the bird again. I wonder what it's going to be this time. Great. If it happens six times in the entire game. Uh, but then there's that and the foxes that will be like, hey, follow me, then you can pet me and then you can. At a certain point, we have to be like, hey, a third of too much. Thank you. Right. We've seen it in TV, though. Like, back in the day, all TV shows were like 20 odd episodes long because it was um, and uh, it needed to last a season. And now in the, in the wake of streaming, it's as long as the story needs it to be isn't it it's um it can be eight episodes five episodes 13 episodes it can be even more right it's uh... i love battlestar galactica as much as anybody who, who was into that in, in, into that genre but after a 23 episode season there are a handful of episodes there which you could really skip mm. that really yeah. moves the narrative along yeah 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 and yeah so yeah i'm gonna say because what about what about the technical enhancement because obviously we're looking in this new generation we've moved into ray tracing and everything needs to be 60 frames per second and and all that kind of stuff is that is that part of, is that stuff that or do you think gamers are not as tolerant of oh one more thing um, i'm just really glad that he said that wages should go up um despite all of the issues with the industry it is tremendously successful gamers do a great job by popping up this industry so the people that create these games they, they do need to deserve they, they do deserve their money like if you're making a if you were a developer that worked on gta 5 right you were there on the ground level or especially if you worked on like let's say gta online you need to be compensated really well because you made this company billions of dollars and it's kind of bs if the company is going to make bs of dollars off of your work and then as compensation you receive a few hundred thousand every few years it's like now nah, maybe you should be well compensated so that's definitely something that is i'm glad that he said that so the quality isn't quite um, the visual quality rather isn't quite there you know i think we've made a lot about visual quality of games, the graphic quality, the resolution mm -hmm. enhancement, the near photorealism that so many games seem to chase. I love that, um, by the way. And our fans thought that was a, was, was, a, was a noble journey. And you know we saw the difference between graphics in PlayStation 1, where Lara Croft is you know, 800 polygons, and you kind of squint and looks like a person. <laughs> and now we get to you know, highly realized um, uh, modeling around that. Um, but did it improve the gameplay? Did it improve the story? Um, visually arresting, but if the, if the game itself doesn't doesn't provide the excitement of the mechanics and a narrative or a story that, that you're interested around, the graphics can't save you. And now this is a great point, isn't it? Because it is, I, I think he's, he's taken a good middle word, word approach. It is a noble thing to push for further photorealism. I appreciate it. And in fact, I feel like we could, Horizon Forbidden West could be a great standard for, for for games that are specifically going for photorealism like you don't need to get any more photorealistic than horizon forbidden west but what i will say is that somewhere along the way we lost interactive worlds you know things where um physics-based engines you know where you could 
throw an apple and you know if the apple hits another apple depending on the velocity and everything maybe it knocks it off the tree and then they roll down the the, the hill in a realistic realistically simulated way or maybe for you as a player um your player character is going into a stream that has a particular speed um they react accordingly to their velocity it changes the angle a little bit like what death stranding was right death stranding was a deeply physically um realized you know kind of engine and and things like movement and velocity and if you're going at this speed and you jump off the vehicle and you're aim, aiming at that direction so on and so forth that physical simulation we don't see that in many games so while i feel like death stranding and horizon forbidden west they can be pretty much the benchmark for photorealism I wonder if we can make physics realism more possible in games, you know, so that if I shoot an arrow at this thing, it clips this leaf and then I see it fall, you know, okay, that doesn't have really minor details, but we can b definitely bring some of the gameplay elements, you know, like for example, again, in Death Stranding, movement is a challenge, you know, for example, if I go through certain dunes, do I feel slower? Games have approximated this to a fairly passable level. But I feel like we're kind of like going super hard on photorealism and we forgot that kind of like there's a lot of there's a lot of joy and gameplay mechanics that can be brought by physics based systems. And if you take a look at Nintendo games, a lot of their gameplay mechanics that people really, really love are physics based, you know, things like again in Breath of the Wild or Tears of the Kingdom. If I take this thing and I attach it in this way and then I add this fan behind it. Oh, look, it's a raft with a fan that makes it a boat. Now I can get across this thing because it's a physics-based system. Or if I start a fire here and there's a lot of kindling or a lot of like grass, I can start a forest fire because it has enough fuel. And again, the physics-based simulation now it creates an updraft that I can now use to reach that hill that I could have reached through some other way, but I was able to create this spontaneous, um, this spontaneous physics-based you know, kind of like vehicle for myself out of my own creativity and my understanding of the physics-based mechanics that are underpinning the framework of this game. And I feel like, yeah, that's definitely something that while Nintendo hasn't pushed for photorealism, a lot of the games do push for like that physics-based realism. You know, even they just came out with um, the trailer for Legend of Zelda Echoes of Wisdom or something. And they've got an echo ability, and I'm like, hey, it's just like beds. You can create a staircase for yourself, and it's like, yeah, that makes sense. Or even Baldur's Gate was um was was popped up by people by saying like, hey, if you stack boxes and you stack enough boxes, you can get over that wall that the guard won't let you get over at the front gate, but you can get it through the sideways because it's a physics-based system, and the game instead of fighting you on that. It accommodates for that because it understands that you can also exhibit natural thinking. So I think that's one thing that I would like to see. We can we can pause, okay, for a while. We can pause for the next generation. We don't have to get better than Horizon Forbidden West, right? We don't have to get better than Death Stranding 2. We don't have to get better than Last of Us Part 2, visually speaking. But physics-based wise, that's something that we could say like, hey, Nintendo underpins a lot of their gameplay mechanics in a physical, like physics-based simulation, something that we used to do, but now we kind of got, we kind of moved away from that. Let's bring it back so we can have the best of both worlds. We can have games that are as uh, gameplay focused and enriching as any Nintendo game, but visually arresting as any PlayStation Studios game. So that would be cool to see. You know, oh, one more thing. I used to love the demolition aspect in Bad Company 2. That's why I love Battlefield Bad Company 2. I love being able to blow up a wall and dynamically create a pathway that wasn't there before because that got us as a squad out of trouble so many times. Like, hey, we're surrounded on all sides. There's a wall on our back. Wait, there isn't anymore because one of us blew up a hole. Let's get out. Let's reconvene and let's be able to kind of on the fly adapt our plans. I was so disappointed when the next games removed the amount of destructions. Yes, they had revolution, which meant that specific moments in the map could be blown up and could create a big change. But the smaller destructible environments, they didn't exist anymore. 
if I have bad company three, destruction and demolition will be a huge part of that. And that is underpinned again by physics based framework. So that would be cool. Maybe put too much emphasis on that. I think, you know, as more we try to chase the uncanny valley, we realize it's not, it, I don't believe it's, it's uh, uh, transversal is possible. I don't think you can get across the uncanny valley. I think that will always be just five steps ahead of you every, every step you go and you won't get there. So instead of chasing that, you know, let's, let's go back to exciting game design. I love a good anime. I love, you know, highly realized uh, animated characters are, um, are exciting because they can tell a different kind of story and, and give a different sort of flavor to the atmosphere that you're in. That's so true. Those things I think are promising to go for. And when you talk about ray tracing and some of that, you know, the console war began as a missile race, mm -hmm. right? Whether it was Sega, Nintendo, then it was Sega, PlayStation, then it was Xbox and PlayStation. And each side is trying to push, push the edge of tech to, you know, we've, we, you know, people talked about teraflops all the time without really understanding what it meant, but somehow more were better than less, and so that was a factor, and you had all these different kind of metrics that people were throwing around to measure their game. But we've gotten to the point now where, you know, with advanced ray tracing and other ways of realizing that most of the platforms can do 60 frames per second. Some can do 120 frames per second, which your, which your eye can't register anyway, but I, I think we're at the edge of the universe of that now. We're in the realm of differences that only dogs can hear. <laughs> and, and maybe that's not where the emphasis should be now on, mm. on pushing the edge of the tech envelope. Um, we're all going to need neural implants to really appreciate all the differences that we're putting in the game right now. Yeah, so <laughs> ray tracing is an interesting one, isn't it? Because basically when NVIDIA made the biggest deal of it, right, when it first released the RTX cards, and then obviously we had great examples at Cyberpunk and everything that will use it and really show a tangible difference. But I think what they, what they portrayed it as was the next evolution, a super desirable evolution in lighting techniques. But... Again, you take a look at games that do not employ ray tracing. You know, they use other illumination methods, global illumination methods, and they have distinct advantages. Nominally, not taxing your, your, your hardware as hard as ray tracing does because ray tracing has to be real time. And global illumination, there can be big layers, there can be, you know, other elements of global illumination that are in real time, but are far less taxing on, on the processor and everything, so you get your frames back. Because now what in, uh, NVIDIA had to do was they, they tax the hardware super, super hard, asking it to create ray trace environments. And then they give you DLSS, which is basically faking frames in order to compensate for the frames you just lost. And now that is a fantastic technological balance that they were able to pull off. You know, it's like a ballet dance. It's like you go hard here so that you can go soft over here. And and, and that's fantastic. But ray tracing was promised to us not as that. You know, we were not supposed to get PISA or DLSS or FSR in order to make ray tracing great. Ray tracing was just supposed to be better. You know, ray tracing was meant to be like... um like what fiber is to the internet. Like if you think about it, if you have a fiber connection to the internet, there's no disadvantage. There's literally no downside compared to like copper cables. Like it's faster, it's better, it's more reliable, it's quicker. It's just boom, next step up. There is literally no downside. Whereas ray tracing to global illumination was more like 4G to 5G. Like yeah, 5G is better in some instances, but mate, if you don't have an antenna like right in front of you or right above you and it loses line of sight with your, with your device, now you have worse speeds than even 4G did. So that was fascinating. Oh, by the way, I'm gonna pause this just for a second because uh, I have to be, well, I have to visit the bathroom. Can we, can we pause this? Yes, we can pause it. Okay, so I'm gonna pause the recording. So there's going to be like a cut in, in about a second. You guys will see it. But yeah, Jesus, I've been here for like, what, two and a half hours? Bah, bah, I gotta visit the bathroom. Okay, I'm back. Here we go again. Uh, let's, uh, let's continue. Well, let's go back to the, the original stories. What can I do that would be amusing, entertaining, interactive, that someone would want to spend some money and spend some time, learn the story, go through this adventure, and, mm. and enjoy themselves and at a, at a way that they feel that they're getting value for money and that we can continue to pay, uh, you know, at least living wages or better to the people mm. who make them. So I've got this, because obviously I, 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 the things when you work, when you work in the games community, you do see the sort of more extreme corners of games communities who don't know, lose their mind because a screenshot suggests the puddle isn't quite realistic enough or um, <laughs> you how, dare, the dog. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, how dare, you know, you know there's, there's a Paper Mario game that's just coming out by Nintendo and apparently runs at 30 frames per second even though nobody, uh, yeah, it's, it's honestly like the worst thing that's ever happened even though I'm pretty sure no one's going to notice who actually plays that game. Um, so is it realistic to sort of then go to games? And you know what, games, we're going to now put out shorter games and we're not going to invest too much in new tech features and actually 
get away with it. Well, you don't say the quiet part out loud. <laughs> <laughs> um, again, let, let's stop looking at the game as, as it's merely a collection of time-based activities with a certain visual acuity to it and um, has a character that you like. You know, let's go back and just look at games. What would be a fun thing to do? Let's create an activity that would be fun and that you'd want to play it, I'd want to play it, and this is how the rules look like, this is what the characters would be like, and not begin to deconstruct a game simply based on, okay, what's its frame rate? Did it, did it hold 60 every time? Did it ever drop below you know, 40 frames per second? And, and um, you know, is it all running at 4K, or do they have to you know, go down to, 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 to 1080p or something? You don't deconstruct movies that way. No. Um, and games are... They're based on tech, but they're built with entertainment in mind. Mm. And is it going to be entertaining or not? It's interesting. I get a lot as well when it comes to the price of games. And the so this is an interesting point, right? Because I'm a photographer. And when you talk to other photographers, the specifications of the tools that you use to create that photo, ne you know, namely the camera, um, really comes into mind. How many megapixels is it? That's what like the big one. That would be like the equivalent of teraflops. Um, what was the sensor size? Is it a full frame? Is it a PSC? Is it a um, micro four third sensor? Is it a one inch type sensor? Is it wh whatever it is, mobile phone sensor, whatever? What lens did you use? At what aperture did you shoot at? What kind of glass did it have? Was it a G Master lens from Sony? Was it a G lens? Was it a Zeiss lens? Um, is it a Leica? Is it a this? Is it a that? The specifications around the instrument, right, that you used, um, super important, super important um, to photography circles. Viewers of my images never once ask anything about the metadata of the photo, ever ever never ever even for things that will actually be useful to them like what should this be you should that why did you make that choice or this or that never once do they ask this so i think the same is true for gamers the digital foundries of the world have facilitated the dissemination of technical information in such a way that a lot of people that are in the gaming discourse fixate on that information and they want it to count for something way more than it actually does to actual people playing the game, the majority of the people playing the game. Often, that can be problematic. Again, there is a reason that I have X level of camera that costs X amount versus the base entry version of that camera. Yes, there are times when the equipment does get in the way of the art that you're trying to use that equipment to create. No problem. We accept this. We understand this. So there is a, a moment where if your game is dropping down to 12 frames per second, that gives a bad that gives a bad experience. If your game doesn't sustain like 1080p and it goes down to 300p, that is a noticeable and that is a worse experience for your end user. But just like in photography circles, I think we gamers in the gaming circles are way too fixated on that stuff like people want to say things like oh horizon forbidden was this is checkerboard rendering bro i've never been able to tell the difference i'm sorry maybe if you give me a native frame versus a checkerboard render frame side by side and i can pixel peep and it's a screenshot and i'm on a really high definition screen maybe i can tell the the the, the difference but when I'm playing the game and I'm actively moving to the game, I'm not going like, oh man, all of this checkerboarding. You, you know what I mean? Like, I don't even know why it's called that. <laughs> I don't know and I, quite frankly, I don't care to know. I am a technically minded person. I appreciate the nuances in the specs. Like when I, if you wanted me to do a tech breakdown or the camera that I'm using to shoot this particular video on, boy, I could do that. I could tell you the advantages and the disadvantages. I could tell you my limitations. I could tell you everything from the most pertinent to the most esoteric. However, at the end of the day, I have shot a great amount of photos on this camera and it's not my best camera, but people have liked those photos more than other photos I came out with what I think is my best camera. It is what it is. The subject matter was different, right? 
And so it's like certain people are drawn to certain things. And I think it's an interesting point. I, it's interesting the, the parallel that we have, you know, and it's a little bit, I think the same parallel exists in pretty much every hobby, you know, like there are some people that drive cars, you know, like they drive cars, you know, like most people drive a car, but these people drive cars, you know, like they, they drive them around racetracks or they take them to this or take them to that. They know the modifications, they know things like engine intake volumes and what different oils do and different tire compounds and they get into the nitty gritty of that. So if you pull up to them with kind of like your factory level, base level, even if it's like a super expensive car, like a 911 GT or whatever, right? They will be like, bro, you are you're not understanding what you bought. You're not understanding these limitations and everything. And they could drill you down to the specs where you would think like, oh my God, I bought a piece of trash, <laughs> you know, because they, they just understand that thing. But the truth is that even if you buy a high performance car, will you drive that car? Will you race that car? Will you take it on track days more than once? Most likely not. Most people don't. Most Ferraris are just going to be driven at like 100 kilometers per hour, maybe 150 max when a person kind of, you know, has a little bit of fun, but they're not going to be pushing 300 kilometers per hour, even though they have the capacity to do that. So it's interesting, the parallels. I've got people saying, you know, if the game isn't running at X amount or is, is only 20 hours long, I shouldn't be paying this amount of money. And I'm like, but my argument for that has always been, I don't go to the cinema and go and see, I don't know, the latest indie movie and then come out and go no it didn't look as good as avengers i need my money back but i don't, I don't it's that's not i don't that's not how i judge the value of, of entertainment um but it, it's i guess value is a subjective thing i'm not entirely sure that wouldn't be a question <laughs> um uh, but but i think your movie references is, is is appropriate because i mean i'm at the point now where i go to you know i look at when i go to see a movie i do now check runtime and if it says runtime two hours and 57 minutes i go geez i don't have that kind of time i can't I can't do that <laughs> well, i don't have yeah. that kind of bladder <laughs> <laughs> Give me a good 95-minute movie that sticks the landing. I'll take that every time. Yeah. What about... And talk about Marvel. I mean, there's another thing where that blockbuster train, you know, began growing in the late 2000, like 2008, 2009, mm -hmm. and then just blew through the 2010s right after the pandemic. And then all of a sudden, no one wants the MCU anymore. Yeah. So people can get all excited about a thing and then go off it really fast. What about... What about, so one of the things we're going to be talking about in GI Sprint, we can talk about a lot about sort of how teams operate and, and mm -hmm. processes and getting things right in the concept stage. There's going to be a lot of that, but we're also going to talk about the technical stuff. And one of the things that we keep being asked about is AI. And um, uh, what I've seen of AI hasn't overly convinced me it's going to make a massive impact on um, <laughs> the speed at which games are being made. Not yet, anyway. But do you think that's a potential avenue to reduce costs? Is that something that um, you've, you're, you're optimistic about? Well, I think we've talked a lot about you know the way we make games has essentially remained unchanged in 40 years. Mm -hmm. And um, Typically when the game gets more complex or there's more heavy lifting yet to be done or we need more art assets, which is always happening, um, typically we've just thrown people at it. Mm -hmm. We throw people at it or we hire some people in Malaysia and throw them at it or we hire some people in Eastern Europe and throw them at it. Um, labor has always been the, like the default response for increased workload and, and scope of game. And you know, I like to think that people in the interactive entertainment business, certainly in the coding and programming side, are some of the smartest um, minds out there in computer science. We need to make the machine do more of the work. We need to get more heavy lifting out of the technology, build the tool. I mean, this is this is fascinating, isn't it? Because, again, he's taking a very middle in approach. You know, he's talking about using the machine as basically a calculator. You know, um, back in high school, you have a problem. For example, let's say you're doing matrices. Um, let's say that you want to do the square of a matrix. So, you know, you set up your grid side by side. Let's say you're doing a two by two matrix. That's going to take you a certain amount of time. Okay. If you're doing a three by three matrix and you try to square it, that's going to take you a certain amount of time. That is much longer than doing the two by two matrix. By the time you try to do a four by four matrix and you try to square that. So now you have two four by four matrices that you need to multiply. It can easily take you an hour. Thus comes in the calculator to save the day because by comparison, I can do a four by four, five by five, nine by nine matrix, and I can multiply it, but to the power of 
99, right? Depending on how much processing power I have on my calculator, if I go on a Wolfram Alpha on the internet and I have access to a supercomputer, I can put it to 999. And nine instantly, I receive an answer. Something that, honestly, if you try to do it by hand, like a nine by nine matrix to like, it just the power of two, do you be spending days? <laughs> and that's assuming you make no mistakes. So AI as a tool that can slide into a developer's toolkit, much as a calculator would into a student or a mathematician's toolkit is fantastic. The problem with AI is that I feel like AI companies, especially like OpenAI, the, the, the CEO just had a, a, a talk where she, she, she spoke about how if AI makes certain jobs obsolete, then maybe those jobs should not have been jobs in the first place. And as cold as it sounds, it's wrong because if you do not have junior roles at a company, you will not be able to train up staff to become senior staff and then train people under them. You will lose a pipeline of creativity. Another thing that makes it wrong is that right now, AI has been based on and trained on and is attempting to, with varying degrees of success, emulating human creativity. If AI becomes ubiquitous in, in a creative kind of like replacement way rather than a calculator way, then we may end up in a society where instead of the AI trying to replicate human works, humans that are coming up are going to try to replicate AI works, you know? And we don't want people to be competing with AI for, for a job or for a creative position. A calculator does not replace a mathematician. Will we be able to find a balance where an AI tool or even a art generation tool will not replace an artist? Because I feel like a lot of these companies are pushing for the latter rather than the former. And that is, that is scary. Cool sets, um, uh, Adobe engines that can help this room. You know, I look at what happened with like, for example, let's talk about AI in terms of photography, right? One of the biggest points of difference that Sony has in their cameras um, that makes that gave them a competitive advantage for a long time, even though that kind of that kind of um, that distance from the competitors is decreasing now. But one of the biggest advantage was autofocus. Listen, if I have a bunch of subjects, you know, or if I have things in front of, even if I just have one person, and let's say that person is my subject. The, the place that I want to be in focus is the eye, okay? The human eye is super important. We don't need to go into it. But the camera, okay, normal cameras do not know what it is that's in front of them. The camera does have a brain to be like, oh, that's a person and that's the eye and I should focus there. Okay, cool. We, we had organisms, organisms, no, sorry. I got distracted by Google then. Uh, we had algorithms that got a little bit better at that. They will start to recognize the general form of a human, then the general face, and then the eye. And then the eye autofocus was kind of okay, but it was kind of hit and miss, and it got better and better and better. But now what they're talking about is bringing AI, you know, deep learning techniques where basically the algorithms are a lot smarter, because usually that's what AI means right now anyway. It means, it doesn't mean artificial intelligence, it means super well-trained or over-trained algorithms or algorithms that were trained on more data sets than ever before. So now AI in cameras can better detect the human eye on a human person, so on and so forth. Great, right? Fantastic. That there is AI being used as a calculator will be to a mathematician. The camera is not deciding when to shoot, what to shoot, how to shoot, what lighting condition, which subject, whatever. But it's saying like, hey, if you put this little box around this person, I can make sure you nail the eye. That is fantastic. And I will and I will always upgrade cameras just to be able to like have that. But then I remember once I was talking about um about this on the podcast with Porter Rock. Uh, but there's another there's another level. And this other level is for example, like with mobile phones, the way that they're pushing their algorithms is like, okay, let's say you want to take a picture of the two FL. Now the two FL is in Paris, it's in a one location, it never moves, right? There's only certain areas that are accessible to the public. So you are most likely going to be on one of these viewing platforms. What happens when they phone is like, hey, 
I see that you've got a 2FL and I see that you are here because it can have the GPS coordinates, right? Like it knows where most of the photos were taken. What if it could be that you're a person like, hey, here's a prompt. Why don't you move to this location and to this exact specific coordinate, right? And then it will have frame lines to guide you there. So you come there and it says, okay, cool. Why don't you hold the phone a little bit up, tilt it just a little bit this way, okay? Wait, and in fact, I'll take the photo. Just hold it here for five seconds and I'll take the photo. Then it will take the photo, right? But because the photo is taken from the exact same spot in similar lighting conditions, it can go pull up from the web and it can compile all different shots, okay? And it will have been trained as, oh, these ones are the, like, the most positive. And then the version that it gives to you isn't a version that you took with your camera because the clouds aren't quite the same. The lighting isn't exactly the same. No, it was a kind of a amalgamation, okay? of data that he had because everybody is doing that and then you are the one and you've got the samsung phone and you're like wow i got this amazing photo right except did you take the photo or did the phone take the photo because if you were just following what the phone was telling you to do what part of human creativity and agency and remember that it basically when you held it like within his frame lines it just took the photo by itself you didn't have to press anything so who took the photo there but then you're not the only one with Samsung phones, right? So now everybody with a Samsung phone is being guided to the exact same spot or the exact same one of three spots, right? And then they're all taking, quote unquote, the same photo. Now that to me is beyond the calculator example, right? Now you have the AI taking the photo and removing human agency and creativity. And I feel like the exact same thing could happen in programming, in developing, or in any other I, or in any other art form, where again now the human is just following the dictations of the machine learning model or the AI model or whatever. So that there is the difference for me. There's a difference between saying like, "Hey, you want to focus on the eye? Let me make sure you can do that as precisely as possible." And then, you know, go with God. <laughs> we hope you take a great photo. Be a good photographer cool to no 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 do this here do this here hold it like this go it like that do it like this do it like that wait for this start boom i've taken a shot and you just get to receive and then again for example samsung was called out right they when you take a photo of the moon because the moon is tidally locked with the earth that means we only ever see the same face of the moon and what they will do is that they will give you a super resolution version of the moon that wasn't actually taken by your optics but it looked like it was because we all pretty much have the same moon to look at. So when you would zoom in, you will see detail that you're like, wow, what? But that's because they were pulling data from all the images. Is that still your photo? There's a debate to be had there. Uh, the guys at Hello Games with No Man's Sky, you know, mm -hmm. a game with ultimately uh, infinite scope, uh, but it's essentially done by less than 10 people. Because they spent a lot of time building the pipeline, a lot of time building the tool set, then then they could just recreate over, 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 over time by a small team, making the machine do most of the procedural heavy lifting. Hmm. We need to get more of that into gaming. Is AI the answer? No, AI is an answer. Hmm. AI is will be an assisting technology. Um, of course, you've got people like McKinsey or other, public, I think it was McKinsey, so I don't want to slander anybody. Some large business consulting group um, has made the claim that by 2030, 50% of games will all be written by AI. That is not going to happen. Uh, AI only sees in one direction, which is backwards. It sees backwards, it puts stuff together to make you think you're seeing forward, but you're really not. You're seeing a rehash of backward. So where I see that AI plays a crucial, uh, uh, can play a very functional role is AI is kind of like the intern, right? The really yeah. eager intern you have that uh, mm -hmm. you say, hey, give me nine pages on something. They're like, sure boss, and they crank it out. Uh, but you do have to fact check it. <laughs> you have to go through yeah. and read it and go, well, actually that's not true because AI hallucinates and AI kind of goes off the rails. But as far as creating first drafts of things, or as far as summarizing, it's a great summarizing tool to take a bunch of knowledge into a space and summarize this in four paragraphs. It's really good at that. So I think we'll see it doing more first draft work. You know, some of the uh, video AI kits that are out there, you can mock up a scene pretty fast to get an idea of, does this look like an interesting thing? Yeah. With, you know, let's have all these cars coming off the top of the Louvre into the square in Paris, what would that look like? And you can kind of mock that up and get an idea. So I think yeah. in that ideation phase, it can help speed things up. Um, but I don't see it writing games anytime soon. When I used to work in print. I mean, it's interesting, isn't it? Because even in that example, there's danger because now who gets to be the intern? If the AI is the one way, you know, for example, you know, if you were at a newspaper or whatever, or you've got sources or whatever, you've got nine 
90 pages worth of stuff to read. You, like back in the day, maybe you give it to an intern and you're like, hey, like summarize this for me. Now, if you can just feed that through a pipeline with AI and then they give you a full thing summary and that 100, like they're like 99% accurate on what they give you, um, where does that intern go now? Like what if that was their way into the company, into seeing the processes of whatever it is, the firm that you're holding. So even there, it can be dangerous, but obviously it is less dangerous than it, than writing the article afterwards. But we have to be careful. That's the thing with AI, man. Like you have to be careful that you don't accidentally just remove a gateway for actual humans to come into the picture. Because for the people that are already there, sure, it can be a great tool, but if that is going to be your primary ideation tool, what if that replaces again junior roles? What if, you know, for uh, let's say Naughty Dog, they want to create a a The Last of Us game, and they're like, listen, um, which city are we going to base this off of? And then I'm like, okay, well, but what if we did like, you know, um, the hills in X amount of place, or maybe like they're like, oh, the hills in Montana. By the way, I don't know if there are hills in Montana. I don't, I don't know the U.S. geography, but let's just say that they they say like the hills in Montana, or they say like, oh, well, let's base it in Paris, okay? Let's 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 base it in in, in Paris or something like that, or maybe they're like, oh, you know what? Let's um, let's have a chapter that is based in Africa. You know, let's let's have something like that. We're gonna have an interesting kind of quest over there. Okay, cool. All right, um, AI. You know, do a little mock-up of Nairobi in the Last of Us world. Done. Normally, that would have been a person. That would have been a person that would have said, okay, well, I've never been to Nairobi. Let me go and research something. Okay, here's what the building looks like. Here's what the iconography looks like. Okay, now I'm going to add about 20 years of decay in here. Okay, what would the law have looked like? Okay, so yeah, oh, well, maybe the people would have burned this building or, or this is actually a resource center. Um, so maybe it would have been preserved because a militant group would have taken over that put that thing and prevented it from, you know, holding and everything. That, that could be a junior role. So even in those examples, we've got to be careful. I used to do games magazines. I'd often try very hard to try and explain to my designer what I had in mind for the cover image. And I actually said, if I had AI access in today, if I had that back then, it would look rubbish and he would design something far better and far more interesting. But it would be a lot better for me to be able to go, rather than try and explain to him or draw a really crude, I'm terrible with drawing, like uh, <laughs> image on a, on a piece of paper of what I want. To actually, you know, I actually, I could see how that could work, but it would be in a, it'd almost be a, a behind the scenes process to deliver something original rather than, um, um, uh, uh, yeah, rather than using it for the actual product at the end. Um, how do you, do you we do we start yeah see that's the thing though but a lot of companies that are AI they want it to be the end product you know they are not pitching it as oh this is part of your idea generation tools you know kind of like a Pinterest you know kind of thing but for your project but you're not going to put the images they find on Pinterest you're going to do your own thing uh, and, I've, and, and I think that's the danger of AI. I think that's why so many people are so apprehensive about it because we have all of the media, we have all of the, you know, kind of like future looking um, uh, media, you know, films and everything telling us about the dangers of AI. And I think those are, a lot of those are, are bang on. So that, that that's the thing that makes AI very dangerous. Um, it is interesting though that he said that, that AI only ever looks backwards because it is based on, again, human works that have come in the past and it can do a, a, a sample of things to make you think that, oh, somehow this is the future, but it's really disgusting. Um, I hate AI generated images. I absolutely hate them. I wish no one would use them. And, but unfortunately, the world is going to normalize those kinds of images and some people are going to start to believe like, oh, those are legitimate art styles and they are not. Of talking about um, the state of the, I'm distracted by your cat, that's cute as anything. Um, <laughs> how, do you, um, <laughs> how do you, um, you talked earlier about the, uh, the state of the games industry currently and what's going on in it. How do you, do you see the, how do you see the current situation coming to an end in terms of the challenges that we're facing? There are a number of different possible endings and some of them are quite horrible. Um, but I think there's hope as well, because we have to have hope. Um, we went through this time you know, of, of artificial growth during the pandemic, mm -hmm. and I would have expected more companies to recognize that this is this is a very limited time party. People, you know, yeah. make hay while the sun shines, but don't don't make huge investments against what you think is a never ending twenty percent growth rate year on year because that's not continuing. Yeah. Um, but you know, get excited in the moment. You don't want to miss the opportunity, and so you bulk up. And you, no, none of us knew how long the pandemic was going to last or lockdown was going to last. So I guess you do make investments to try to jump on the potential that may be longer than you know it turned out to be. Um, but that's a huge gamble, you know. You're yeah. betting on the, 
you're betting on the common. If it doesn't happen, then um, you're stuck out of position with a huge labor load. And I think a lot of companies found them that way. Um, large Scandinavian concerns, which were never a big player in the gaming indus industry, became one of the top four players in the gaming industry almost overnight. Mm -hmm. And um, apparently their reach has exceeded their grasp, and so now they're restructuring their, their empire. He's talking together. about Embracer. Um, but even big players like my old shop or uh, my old uh, competition over at Xbox, they're, they're finding that, um, as I think we also said in a, in a talk a couple of years ago, that um, acquisition is the easy part, integration is the hard part. Mm -hmm. It's easy to buy a thing, it's hard to run a thing. And I think a lot of companies are, if not having necessarily buyer's remorse, are certainly finding it uh, harder to digest what they've consumed. And yeah, that's that's so that's so true, right? Because it, it is the analogy again of like you buy a really expensive car, but then running that car, maintaining that car, and the upfront costs and sorry the upkeep costs and you know the insurance, everything like that, that makes it much harder. You know, it's not different than one these um. Let's say whether they are YouTubers or they are social media influencers, they get like they touch real money, like real millionaire kind of money, um, and then they buy themselves a mansion, not thinking to themselves like, wait, my. So I was I was watch. I told you guys I like interior design, right? Part of that is real estate, and I was listening to this guy. Uh, he's a real estate agent and broker in um, like the LA Hills area, and he talks about mansions and he's like. A person that has critiqued lots and lots of mentions right and he talks about how uh, with certain mentions that are on hills in California um, I think LA is in California right I think I'm getting that right okay it doesn't matter the information is what matters so he talks about how certain mentions uh, because they are uphill and it's a very foresty hill okay when fire gets started and fires happen quite often in California they go up the hill so he says that with some of these mentions, just because of their location, the fire insurance alone, okay? So you have a mention that will cost like, let's say like $40 million, okay? The fire insurance alone will be forty dollars to $60,000 per month for fire insurance, per month. No other insurance. This isn't theft. <laughs> this isn't like, I don't know, floods. <laughs> this is nothing else but the fire insurance. It's not your electricity bill, which apparently some of those mentions, $15,000 a month on electricity. So now you have, let's say you're on the, let's say you're on the low end. You have a 30,000 fire insurance. You have a per month, by the way, $15,000 per month electricity bill. Uh, you know, then you have other types of insurance. Let's say that's another $10,000 or whatever. Um, let's say that you don't have a private driveway. So now that goes up because now random people can come up to your door. <sighs> you have running costs, $100,000 every single month. So maybe you're a YouTuber that made it big and you have the opportunity to, you know, you have the, the fortune to be able to, buy um, a mansion such as this. Let's say your mansion costs $20 million. Great, you're getting this exclusive location, get a community, but then suddenly $100,000 every single month are being pulled out of your account just because you have the house. And when you talk about things like fire insurance, even if you're like, holy shit, I didn't expect all of this, and you try to back out of it, while you are still trying to sell it, you can't stop paying the fire insurance. You have to keep paying it. That's another thirty thousand dollars. So you can see how that that can f with your mind, right? Because now you're thinking to yourself, wait, I need to make a hundred thousand dollars every single month just to be able to keep this house, and this isn't furnishing it. <laughs> this is barely running it. It's not the staff that you need to keep now because you have a mansion with like twelve bedrooms. You're not gonna clean them, you know. And what do these rich people do? That them they, you stepped into the world, and what do they do? They keep staff living in the quarters on the property most of the time. They have staff quarters so that people don't have to leave. They can just clean your house 24-7. But that's what you sign up for. And so I feel like these companies, similar thing, man, similar thing. They, they bought something and that was relatively easy compared to running it and being surprised by all of the costs that come with it. And um, sadly, uh, it's leading to some of this. Uh, labor layoff problem we've seen that began in 23 which hasn't really abated in 24 yeah it's it's 
there's a thing uh, I again not just about Microsoft other companies do it as well it's with a, we, a lot of people adopt this limited integration approach now where they buy a studio and they sort of all, they leave it will leave you to do your thing and explore you know some of the companies that you mentioned there do that but actually there is an element of me that I look at the games they were making and they've decided to make as a team and I think you, maybe we did need we just need to be a bit slightly stronger hand here on what um, maybe that's the wrong thing to say maybe they should be allowed to be creative and try the new things and stuff but I look at some of I look at what those companies may have needed to um, to grow and what what they were putting out and it wasn't necessarily there weren't necessarily there's a, there seemed to be a clash between letting the developers do what they want to do and also whilst needing the stuff to deliver the growth you, you might have for your subscription service or your console or your or your publishing business or whatever um, uh, I don't know if I, if I agree with my, even with myself about <laughs> saying that out loud but, um, but, there, there is, I, I, but sometimes sometimes I look at I look at um, the output of some of these companies you know and you, you saw it with you know your old shop um, and so some of the stuff they've closed are studios that are working on projects that they commissioned a couple of years ago when the industry looked different and they thought oh these games are working these games are what's going to drive for us and then very quickly now they've come out I find it I, you know what, I'm just I'm sort of jumping around a little bit but you what you it. were saying what you were saying earlier about um, games companies making decisions based on what they saw during the pandemic baffle me right it just it just it not just came from any companies I work I, I'm just about to not work for them we're about to um, it's about to be bought by different companies but I work for Reed Pop and during the pandemic of course they were an events business they decided that events and they were fearful the events would never come back. So they started to pivot and invest, and they, they, they cut staff in certain areas and invested in other areas with the idea of where um, they thought things were going to go post-pandemic. Um, and here's the thing, what happened, less so in games, but very much in the Comic-Con industry, the events came back stronger than them before. So what they've now had to do is they've now had to pivot back to the... But like, why did you make the assumption in the first place that the that this was going to be, that the whole in the world was going to be so radically... You know, the, industry, the world has changed coming out of the pandemic, mm -hmm. but changed to the point, but how did you know... We didn't know what was going to happen. We're making decisions based on that, I, it's, there was nothing to base these opinion decisions on. Yeah. So Chris over here is, you know, he's 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 stumbling over his words and everything, but that just proves, you know, his passion about the the, the particular topic and the, the train of thought that he's on. But essentially, I think what he's trying to get at is, people made a lot of reactionary decisions, right, in, during the pandemic. Uh, they reacted to the fact that, especially in gaming, there were a lot more people gaming. There was a lot of money coming in. Um, they reacted to the live service trend, which, I mean, it didn't really, like it started way before the pandemic, way before the pandemic, of course, but it came into a maelstrom, you know, a fiery thunderstorm of its own uh, because of the pandemic. Um, and PlayStation is, is not, you know, innocent of that. They are quite guilty of it themselves. You know, they were coming out, talking to us about 12 live service games by 2025, and I was always going to be like, but wait, how will you ever learn your lessons between one game or the other? This pace that they have now, where they seem to be doing like two-ish live service games per year, that's a much more reasonable pace, right? But he is right, you know, it was so reactionary. And the thing is, I think people, we, we assign measures of intelligence or wisdom, you know, to people who happen to be financially successful. Not understanding that these companies that can be worth billions or trillions of dollars are run by really everyday humans that are just as susceptible to the same fallacies as the common man that may only earn like three dollars per hour. You know, so we, we, we think to ourselves that they are somehow infallible. Like take a look at Google Stadia. When Google Stadia first came around, I was like, this is going to like this is already dead. You know, I remember I used to like go into the comment section of and now your mama knows, right? That was the name of the channel. Um, and I would just go like this daily thing that you like, it's completely unsustainable and it's completely dumb. <laughs> like, I'm sorry. And you'd be like, oh, you know, how do you know? How do? It's like because it's obvious because they felt the succumb to a fallacy thinking that somehow the, the Internet, the infrastructures that we have, the people, the tendencies, all of those things were going to magically, they were not ready before Stadia launch, but they were magically going to adapt and metamorphosized to a version of, of the real world where Stadia will be a successful platform, you know? I mean, they thought it would be one of the biggest platforms. And I was like, no, how can you start from a point of like, there's not enough in internet infrastructure to even prove your thesis to like, oh yeah, we'll just release Stadia and somehow ISPs are going to give people faster internet because of us. Mm -mm, mm -mm. It, it always started from a fallacy. 
in thinking that Stadia was going to be the thing. But Stadia was helmed by who? Google, one of the most successful companies. And people forget that that, again, the humans behind that company or the humans in that company are the head of that company. They can make mistakes just like any of us. And you don't have to be a billionaire yourself to tell a billionaire that they are being foolish with their money. It was, um, and I, and yeah, sorry, I'm ranting a little bit. I'm going all over. No, it's okay. I've got my cat's tail in my mouth. Um, <laughs> the, yeah, but it's, it's human nature, right? You know, if you're, if you're at the craps table and someone's got the hot hand and they're, and they're, you know, running the table, you just want to jump on that train mm. and, and get a piece of that before it goes. Yeah. yeah. Um, that's why patience is the thing that's important. And the industry is losing patience. You know, we need to find a way to solve this problem in six months. In an industry where nothing gets done in six months, mm. right? Um, you know, you talked about people buying studios and talking about creative autonomy and we love the creatives and we're going to let them, you know, do their thing and, and build the great games they're here to make and we're not here to tell them what to do. Sorry. Sweetie. I love it. Sweetie, daddy's on TV. Okay. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, we say, we talk about studio autonomy, creative autonomy, and we give them all that sort of thing and that's, that's great, that's good and we're not going to tell you how to build your game because you're the expert on that. We just want to, you know, help you uh, re realize your goal. Fine and good. But the minute... The minute the money thing gets a bit tight across the whole enterprise, all of a sudden the companies come back to all the studios and say, we're in a tough spot, we're going we're to miss our profitability targets, um, everybody's got to take a haircut. And some of the smaller studios are going, well, I have, I, why do I need the haircut? I mean, you bought me for a little bit of money over here to give me some freedom to do this, the thing I do. Um, I didn't tell you to spend double digit billions of dollars on buying other stuff. <laughs> that all of a sudden will be the sacrificial lamb because you've got to make that balance sheet work on your other that that is so true and you see you see the the frankness and the honesty is just so different <laughs> that is the that is the truth right and this is the same across any company a company head the ceo will be like hey guys will will buy seven you know like boeing 787s and everything not doing their due diligence to check like hey have these planes been made well and then you you're like i don't know in a small little accounting firm or whatever like you know you're just like hey you know we we are <laughs> we are partners with this company that bought all of these planes and then they're like oh yeah so those planes were a terrible idea and instead of firing the people the person that made that decision ultimately of reducing their salary they're like do we need that accounting firm and you're like wait but i only cost you like <laughs> you know two hundred fifty thousand dollars for my entire firm and it's like 12 of us why do you need to take us out? And it, like, we didn't tell you to go and do that. Like we, in fact, some of us told you not to. And, but no, you have to be the ones that, that suffer. And it's the same thing. And I think that there is a conversation that could be had about the fact that a lot of these publishers are publicly traded companies and they have to do the impossible. They have to somehow hit profitability targets that are year on year more impressive than the last year on year or quarterly target and that is just such a fallacy how are we still allowing how is in this world of like smart intelligent people that can tell that year on year growth that is forever going to grow and that's unsustainable but we we have a stock market that is literally predicated on this company needs to make more money and grow even if it is already at the peak of, of what it can do you know take a look at facebook like they squeeze you as as, as one of their customers or so one of their users they want to squeeze you dry to get all every single bit of data that they can out of you every single bit of money that they can out of you every single thing that they can they want to squeeze you and squeeze you and squeeze you and then when they realize that they can't squeeze you anymore on facebook they go and buy other platforms where you might be so that they can squeeze you there too all because they're a publicly traded company and that is really what they need to do in order to keep giving this unsustainable year-on-year -year growth. It's better with companies like Valve. It's better like companies like Larian who are privately owned and where people don't have to answer to a marketplace that has these unreasonable expectations. Unfortunately, I'm not sure. I know that there is a process, I think, by which a company can buy its shares back and basically become private again. But bro, <laughs> like the chance of that happening with a conglomerate like Microsoft, like Sony, like Apple, like, you know, all of these big companies, bro, the chances of that happening, uh, I mean, you, you, you have better luck being like struck by lightning twice on the same spot. Like, <laughs> it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. So 
Yeah, it's, it's so sad, you know, like you take a look at something like Tango Gameworks and it's like, yeah, you went and you bought uh, Activision Blizzard, you spent 70 billion on them and now suddenly your balance sheet is looking one way and you're thinking, well, who do we really not need? Who is inessential here? And it's like, you little rhythm game creator, yeah, you can go. I'm sorry, you have to go. Purchases, so it's it's not it's not a true offer right when they say we're yeah. going to buy you and give you all of your autonomy unless of course our other financial agencies force us to close you yeah yeah things well, are definitely. completely out of the control of the small studio yeah and it's if sometimes i do feel a bit you know for certain companies i feel because when you when you're when your competitors are increasing salaries and and hiring yeah. up and, and and you know investing in their ip it, it takes a brave company to go yeah we're not going to do that <laughs> I mean, you know because you know you want to keep up right so i know this is a lot of people say the games industry spent too much money so i i think some companies didn't necessarily want to um, Nintendo uh, did was, okay. Yeah, but uh, there was a great example of Nintendo. I don't know, I don't know how true this is. It's a story I was told by someone who was associated with it. But Nintendo bought Next Level Games during that period of sort of acquisition. Mm. It's basically all they bought, but they didn't really want to. Next Level Games wanted to jump on the fact that loads of studios were being bought up, their valuations were going up, there was benefits. They the account of that company decided to sell, and Nintendo had a choice. They could let the company be sold to someone else that you know didn't know, mm. or they could buy them. And ultimately, they make their Luigi's Mansion game. It's a big hit game for them. Nintendo, in a way. I don't know if that's true, but I imagine there was an element of the fact that they felt they had to um, do something that, that maybe they wasn't really. They don't buy many companies, Nintendo. But you're right, Nintendo is a is the wonderful. Um, uh, a lot of Japanese companies actually um, mm -hmm. didn't. Were just very, you know, they increased salaries and stuff, but they were quite conservative outside of that. Um, right, but the, um, the next level story, you know, spoke to even Nintendo gets FOMO. <laughs> right, and FOMO yeah. is what drives the whole thing. You know, you see Google hiring ten thousand Metaverse employees. And then you know your net your uh, Facebook. You got to buy yourself some Metaverse employees because you don't want Google to have all the Metaverse guys. Mm. And it just swings around. And now you get rid of the Metaverse team and you put in the AI team, and everyone's throwing a bunch of money around to build these things because yeah. they don't want to miss the AI train, whatever that, whatever that means. Yeah. Well. Yeah. It it, it is it is is fascinating, isn't it? Because it, what what they say here is, is precisely true. You have this movement, especially in Silicon Valley, right? Because Silicon Valley, all of these companies, I mean, they all hate each other and they all, you know, would, <laughs> they will all sell their souls of all of the employees to see one of them fall. Um, so, for example, um, we have Metaverse creative directors at some point, like positions where it was like, what is the Metaverse? But everybody was talking about the Metaverse. Remember the Metaverse craze? It was like, what, 2022 or something? Like Meta changed the name and then suddenly everyone took it even more seriously than they were before. Before that crypto, oh my God, crypto. Like, oh, everybody was like, oh, maybe we should do Bitcoin. And then everyone was, no one asked like, is it smart? Or are we just jumping onto a trend? But it's almost like they, they get fear of missing out because if they have to wait at the station, by the time that they see that the train is indeed going to somewhere that they want to go and is indeed sustainable and robust and well made, now it's too late. They don't want to be called, they don't want to be Blackberry, right? They don't <laughs> they don't want to be Blackberry who sees the iPhone and then it's like, yeah, nah, we don't do touch screens. That's silly. And then you're like, oh, that's what people want. And now you try to start up and all of the engineers that are great at, at that hardware and specializing there they've all been bought up they've been bought up by samsung they've been bought up by apple they've been bought up by htc at the time lg at the time sony ericsson at the time you know like now you're looking around like oh shit, we have to train our people to do this now but they were the same people telling us that we didn't want to do this because we didn't need to do this because it was silly ah they that they, they left that left that caught off guard and everything but now and then we have this other very reactionary, very knee-jerk reaction. And then as soon as one trend seems like it's going on a downward trend, they dump it for the new one. Now it's AI, right? Like, remember when we had all of these assistants, like, you know, you had the Googles, you had the Alexas, you had the Siri's, you had the, um, what did Microsoft have? Cortana, right? It was the battle of the virtual assistant. Now is the battle of the AI. Now is Copilot Plus, and Apple just came out with Apple Intelligence. You know, everybody is trying to like convince customers that somehow us looking into your data in this way will give you things that you want, but also we're going to preserve your privacy at the same time. And that's what the gold rush is. And now it's like, wait, what if this isn't it either? Now you're going to have a lot of people that again have to be laid off. And I bet you that will not happen though until there's another train to jump to because that's what I noticed with these companies, man. What I noticed with these companies is that even if the train is going down, they will go down with the Titanic so long as there isn't another big 
idea, fancy thing that they can throw their money at. You know, like if, for example, tomorrow, NASA is like, we have created a new rocket engine that will allow us to spend the equivalent uh, fuel, okay, that it takes to power a normal, you know, like mom, soccer mom van, like 55 liters of fuel. But with this engine, it's so goddamn efficient, it's so goddamn powerful that we can make it to Mars in like a week, right? Rather than nine months, a week. But it will only cost this much fuel. And also because of that, with a little bit more fuel, we can carry mega quantities. Now everybody will be talking about um, colonization of planets. You will see Meta switch from the Metaverse to being like, yeah, we're going to be the first conglomerate on Mars, you know, and they're going to go buy land <laughs> in Mars, right, that they can't access, but they'll be like, I'm going to buy this level of the planet. And if another company is like, hey, we can terraform a planet now, now you're going to see all of that money, you know, that was going to go into AI and the Metaverse and everything, that's going to be deaded the minute they hear this, and I'm going to say, okay, we are going to go and colonize the moon, we'll colonize Mars, we'll colonize Venus, we'll colonize Jupiter, you know, we'll buy land rights, you know, to all of these planets because that will be the next gold rush, you know, so it's like, that's the thing. So if AI is not going to be it, what's going to be the next it trend, I wonder, what other, you know, why are these billionaire companies and trillionaire companies um, going to chase after because just like the everyday person, they have the fear of missing out. Whatever the next one is, so we've gone through a bunch of those now, haven't we? Um, so, what advice would you give to studios right now that are trying to make maybe make their budget stretch a little longer, make their runway a bit, a bit, a bit better? What, what advice would you give to them? Be disciplined and murder your darling. Oh. That's one thing we see in studios where they will hold on to a, a thought or an idea or a wish, um, and you have to constantly interrogate what what it is you think you're doing, mm. and speed up proof of concept, speed up proof of tech, so you can make the hard call and say that's not working. You know, the people who continue to try to make the thing work over an extended period of time thinking, if we just do a little bit more, we can get there. But your rest of, the rest of your game is sometimes just waiting for that mechanic to be established. And it's going to slow you down. You've got to have a really good idea, a disciplined idea of what it is you want to make, how you're going to make it. Hold your deadlines tight. Don't be slippy slippy on your alpha target or your beta target. Um, look to teams that, that do it right. I, any team that builds an annual sports game, that's a wonder to behold. Mm. They do a new game in nine months every year. Because, like at my old shop where they did MLB The Show in San Diego, Major League Baseball is not changing opening day. It's April 1st every freaking year. Yeah. And, but you can say, well, they know what they're doing. It's the same 32 teams. It's the same you know, stadia. It's the same players. So they have to move them around. Yeah, because they've identified what their variables are year to year. Then they have a list of, here are things we can add. We take care of all the maintenance of moving the players around, updating stadia, getting new face scans. And here's some new things we can add over time. But then you have a date when you go, that's it, feature lock, boom, we're done. Yeah. Too much of game development... And I'm sure by saying this, I'll get a bunch of game developers to go late and you're so old school, you don't know that we've made so many changes, we're so much better than we used to be. Watch Mythic Quest on Apple Plus. <laughs> I, I, I watched that. <laughs> to get, someone told me to watch that. It says, it's a great comedy. I said, what do you mean comedy? It's a documentary. <laughs> <laughs> um, because there is a lot of, but that's, you know, that's the creative process, right? You want to be able to have people have be inspired and come up with new ideas and, and really have a flash moment where I've solved the problems of the universe and let me tell you how I did it. Um, but you've got to have a strong hand in management, production management, or as we call it, artist management. Um. That's the thing that um, a lot of these gaming studios, even at Sony, PlayStation don't have producers because he's really talking about producers because producers are the not fun people. They're the people that tell you that, hey, that idea, that gameplay mechanic that you just came up with, you have 12 hours to make this work. Otherwise, the ship is selling on without it, you know, because because if it doesn't work, bro, the whole game we can't be spending six months because the whole game will not move forward uh, if now you decide for example if they were like hey emmanuel uh we love uh your talk about um physics being brought back into into games so if you if you have this interaction that should work and that should work okay but now that's a thought right that's a wish how do you turn that into a gameplay mechanic okay well why don't we copy something like what uh, zelda did or what you know nintendo did in this game or that game okay okay we could see how that could work in our environment okay cool how long is this going to take to program into the entire fabric of the game that we were already making and it's already been three years and it's like three and a half other years 
yeah, maybe it's not making it to this title. <laughs> maybe you make it into the sequel. You know, it's it's, it's things like that. Um, and you, you need a producer to be there to be like, yeah, guys, listen, feature lock. You can't do it. Even even with things like animation, like at a certain point, it's like, listen, Ellie's hair is realistic enough. You could you could add more fluid simulation. You can add more strength simulation. You could add more this. You could add more that. And you're very smart and you're very talented, but it is still going to take you a long amount of time. And again, we'll not be able to ship if other people that are downstream from you cannot get the work done because you are still fiddling around with this new system that you came up with. You've got it's not going to make it. And I think that PlayStation Studios need more studio managers and they need multiple teams so that some teams can take a core concept and create an entire base around it. But that would be the experimental concept, you know, it'd be like Rift Apart that took the portals and they created an entire game around the rifts, right? That was basically it. Uh, but then they were able to take those lessons into the mainline games, you know, with Spider-Man 2. I think you need you need that tit for tack, and I think you need three teams in a particular studio. You need the main team that is spearheading the big opus, the Odyssey, you know, the system seller, right? Then you need two teams that are satellite teams that are working, all of these teams in parallel, but that are working on certain niche concepts and ideas and really fleshing out the tech behind it. You probably need four teams. Like you probably need like a tech team under them that are like is going to update the engines and everything in real time so that people have the best tools that they can at every single point of the journey. But that's, you know, that's whatever. Uh, but yeah, you probably need that in order to bring freshness and interactivity and game mechanics and fun back into gaming in a way that is, um, you know, reminiscent of the way that we brought visual acuity into gaming as well. So yeah, um, fascinating point, fascinating point. To keep people with their eye on the ball, so that's great, that's great. We've missed the window for that feature in. Oh, but it'd be so good if we did. It will break all these other things if we do. Yeah. So hold on to that, we'll come back to it, but stay on, stay on path, stay on course. My, my original magazine, so my original job, I worked on an MCV magazine and it was a weekly. And, and most people in my field at the time worked on monthly magazines and they could never understand how, and my team was no bigger than a monthly magazine. And they could never understand how we would do, and it's like, how do you put that out? And sometimes the magazines were 100 pages, like as big as a monthly, depending on how successful, particularly at Christmas. Right. Um, and by the way, I have the same concern about people who do daily papers, like I don't know how they do that. But, um, but the thing is, we had a process, right? We had a, we had a system, like, you know, we, we each day had its thing. And once we got through, to, once we got to that point, like, that's that section of the magazine done. We've got to, it's got to be done, it's got to be out. And we, and magazine had to come out every Thursday. It had to come out every Thursday, you know, we couldn't, if we slipped, it was now at the weekend and we'd, we'd missed all the, with this industry paper, right? Nobody worked there. So it's, um, we, 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 we would never, we never slipped. I worked on it for nine years. I did, I did 450 magazines and we never, we were never late. And, um, and some, that included when there was a bank holiday. We, you know, we had to do it in four days in those situations. Um, and, um, but it was because we were just drilled. We just weren't, you know, we, we, there was room for innovation and there was room to be creative. And then, but there was also times when you stopped doing that and you had to put it out. And if you, if you had an idea that didn't make it, you had a feature concept, oh, you know, you had a, 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 a visual idea we couldn't quite pull off. It's all right, there's another issue. <laughs> there's another one in a, in a few days. Um, and, um, and, it, and it just went into that instead. And that's, and that's how it worked. And it was, and it was, it was, it was, it wasn't, I don't want to call it like a, it wasn't a, um, a sort of conveyor belt of you know um, uh, assembly lines, but there was an element of there were certain things we didn't need to change, um, and um, we could right. we could repeat and copy paste. But yeah, I think it just basically backing up what you're saying there from my peer experience. Develop a process and stick to it and be disciplined about it. Yeah. And if you can turn games around in two to three years rather than five to six years, it's easier to set aside an idea now because you go, I'll get back to it in two years. Yeah. Then in the current model, where if I don't get this idea now, there may not be a sequel and there may never be a chance for this thing to ever be seen yeah. six years from now. So. Yeah, and it must be quite. I always think whenever uh, I speak, my brother who works at Playground Games, working on a new Fable game, he's thirty years old almost, and he was telling me the day that he thinks he's got four or five games left in him, and that for yeah. me was like, oh goodness, that, imagine thinking like that. <laughs> it's, it's, it's how long these projects take to make. Um, so I've taken way too much of your time, Sean. Um, uh, <laughs> it's always good. I, to, always good to hang with you, Chris. It's amazing stuff. That um, and so I'm gonna I'm gonna call it there. That is all we have time for. Thank you so much for right. your time and insight. Keep the schedule, right? Yeah. Well, yeah. It's it's, it's it's yes, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Let's keep to the message. Uh, it's always inc it's always incredibly valuable uh, hearing what you what you've got to say and what you've got to learn. Um, for those listening or watching, there will be more to come from GI Sprint and all sorts of topics like AI and cloud and team synergy and failing fast and getting hybrid working to work and and distributed teams and all sorts of stuff that's going on over the course of the month. And um, the easiest way to make sure you don't miss any of it would be to sign up for the Games Industry Biz newsletter. It's completely free. It's at Games Industry Biz forward slash newsletters okay so um 
fantastic interview. Great job there. Sean Layden must be allergic to his cat because his nose was funny as hell. <laughs> but hey, it happens. We're all human. Uh, listen, I really love this interview. I think that um, obviously the purpose of it was far different from the purpose of the um, IGN interview. But I think the demeanor towards the guest, uh, Sean Layden in this case, was a lot more respectful. But without necessarily just like, oh yeah, let me blow smoke up your bum, uh, which which I appreciated a lot more. Um, the answers were a lot more poignant, um, were a lot more honest about the state. Like imagine if those answers had been given by Phil Spencer. Like, hey, listen, they don't even have to be the negative answers like when it relates to like Tango Gameworks and everything, but just honest answers about like, this is the state of the industry. And perhaps they could even say like, hey, listen guys, we're going to bring you games but we don't want to necessarily invest in a game that's going to take eight years to make. We're going to give you games that we can give to you within a reasonable time frame, like two to three years. Like if you have a great idea here, we'll get it to you. And if we have that idea a little bit late, well, we'll get it to you next time. You know, that's basically what they were talking about next time. And it's like, that will be so valuable because that's still something that you can say that is a positive thing when you're still a part of the company. Um, but, you know, Phil Spencer would have told you, oh, great games for great people, like great teams, um, in great places, for great players to play wherever they want in a great way. And it's just like, bro, come on, give us substance. So um, I didn't really know how many contrasts there would be drawn between these three interviews if you had them back to back. Uh, this is what, a three and a 40 minutes video. Jesus Christ. <laughs> That's crazy. But... I really enjoyed these interviews. Um, both of them had something to offer. So yeah, I'm going to pretty much leave it at that. It was fun talking to you guys. And you know what? Now that we have broken the three hour mark, uh, now, now the sky's the limit. We're just gonna, we're just gonna go from now on. Like two people are going to get to the end. having watched everything in this video. <laughs> But now that the channel has broken this barrier, I'm going to, oh my goodness, now it's just going to be movie fest. <laughs> okay, listen, if by somehow or somewhere you've made it all the way through to this one, I mean, that is commendable, okay? Because as much as I like my own ideas and my own expressions, and I think that I have something of value to give, um, this marathon, three hours and 45 minutes, pretty much by the time we're done, uh, that is, that's a lot. That is a lot. There was even a toilet break in there. So that's just crazy. So I commend you. Thank you for sticking to it. Or if you just skip forward and this is the part where you got up to, thank you for having clicked on the video anyway. You know, it is always um, a humbling act to see that anybody would even be interested in my thoughts. So wherever you decide to sign off or whatever it is that you decided to do, I thank you for having spent that time with me. And uh, yeah, I'll talk to you next time. And I promise the next video will be about the same length. <laughs>